Good morning and welcome to our 2021 Power Mobility and Convenience Conference. I'm Sarah Johnson, Head of Retailer Engagement, and I will be chairing today along with my colleague Ed Woodall, Government Relations Director. It's great to have so many people watching live and we know that so many watch it back afterwards, so thank you for coming. We have two sessions today, the first, the future of power and mobility, and the second, the shop of choice. In the first session, we have an expert panel of industry and government representatives to share insights about the future of power and mobility and what it means for forecourts. In the second session, retailers from across the sector will be sharing details of their sites and telling us how they see the future of convenience on forecourts. I'm going to hand over to Ed Woodall now to give more details of the first session. Thank you, Ed. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ed Woodall. I'm Government Relations Director at ACS, and I'm really pleased to be facilitating this session on the future of power mobility and what it's going to mean for fuel retailers. There's such a disruption in this area and such uncertainty, so hopefully this morning we'll bring you some clarity from um, some expert speakers. Firstly, from Government, Verena from the Department for Transport, who's going to talk about the government's decarbonising transport plan and what it might mean, what it holds, what policy proposals we can see coming forward. Then we're going to hear from Owain from the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders to talk a little bit about the supply chain, what's coming through the supply chain from car manufacturers, where they're investing, what that might mean for what consumers buy in the future, and of course, how they'll fuel and power their vehicles in the future. And then finally, of course, we want to hear about retailers' investments. So we're going to hear from Tom at BP, who's going to share some insights around where they're investing and how they see the power and mobility market developing in the future. So some really great insights to share with you. There's an opportunity at the end after all the speakers have finished to ask your questions. So please put them in the chat and I'll look out for those as I'm chairing and I'll ask those questions directly to them. So without further ado, I'll pass over to Verena to start the presentation. Okay, good morning everyone. Um, so I'm here today to present on the government's wider strategy to decarbonize transport. So I will present on the Transport Decarbonisation Plan, um, which was published on the 14th of July, and sets out how we will deliver the transport contribution to future carbon budgets and to help meet net zero. And at the end of the presentation, I will also speak a bit more about the commitment specific to low carbon fuels, which is the policy area that I'm working on. Uh, first of all, as a general background, um, it's important to highlight that transport is now the highest emitting sector in the UK. Um, so in 2019, 27% of GHG emissions uh, could be attributed to the transport sector. And this is largely due to other sectors having successfully managed to reduce their emissions um, across the board by 43%. However, transport emissions only dropped by a mere 3%. So this presents a significant challenge. Um, in June 2019, the UK also legislated for net zero GHG emissions across the economy. And it's also worth pointing out that we need to comply with our carbon budgets, which set five-year caps on uh, economy-wide GHG emissions out to 2050. So in response to all of this, the Secretary of State announced in October 2019 a bold and ambitious program to cut carbon emissions, transport emissions by 2050. And this was a starting point for the transport decarbonisation plan. Um, it identified six priority areas, which are listed here. Um, but maybe it's a bit more useful to see it on the next slide set out, um, quite nicely graphically. And it's important to highlight that with the transport decarbonisation plan, um, we have for the first time taken a holistic and a cross-modal approach to set out a credible and ambitious path for the entire transport sector. And this is also reflected by these six themes. Um, also to highlight that the transport decarbonisation plan pushes what is technically and feasibly possible in every area to the highest level that we think credible and is the biggest piece of what we have done to tackle greenhouse gas emissions from the transport sector. Um, so this slide uh, sets then out the scale of the challenge, and I hope um, the graph is big enough to be seen on every screen. 
Um, so basically what you can see here is the top line. We present um, the projections um, for the policies that we had in place prior to the transfer decarbonisation plan. So they did project emissions to fall steadily, but at a much slower pace than needed. And just for example, um, for 2032, they would only have uh, met half of the emission reductions that would be required. So the transport decarbonisation plan makes the first step to increase the sweep of the emission reductions. Um, and a lot though will of course also depend on how quickly technology um, develops and how quick consumers are to adopt these and any behavioural changes. So it's always good to bear in mind that it is just a start and we will need to review this plan periodically to make sure it's up to date with the latest evidence. Um, this slide basically sets out um, some of the measures and announcements um, that were um, published during the development of the TPP, just to flag that it was um, a process, not just one document. So you have, for example, um, the decision on the ban of the new sale of new petrol and diesel vehicles that are non zero emissions in there. I'm not going to read out the whole list, you can read it here, but there were a lot of announcements around it as well. Also important to flag is that the development of the plan was accompanied, and actually the plan was also developed through quite extensive stakeholder engagements. So yeah, you can see the numbers of responses that we had. Um, and also saw that there were about you know, 60 online workshops and um, as well as direct engagement with stakeholders, as well as a whole new board that was set up as external advisors. Um, the actual publication uh, received a lot of media interest and um, overall stakeholder reactions were quickly positive. So you can see some of the endorsements on this slide. So apart from the transport decarbonisation plan or the actual document, which sets out the various commitments um, and plans how to reduce emission, emissions in different policy areas, be it road vehicles, rain, maritime, freight, low carbon fuels. Um, on the day, there were also a lot of other key announcements um, which were published alongside the plan. Um, so you see, for example, the publication for the ban of the sale of non-zero emission um, heavy duty vehicles and buses and coaches, um, a consultation on net zero aviation and so on. So there were a lot of other key documents published alongside. Um, this slide is another overview, um, just sorted by different areas. Um, so, for example, walking and cycling, uh, rail, freight, maritime, aviation, cars. Again, I won't read it all out here, but um, it's just to show yeah, the breadth of um, measures that are basically associated with the TTP. Um, Coming now to the final slides, and this is um, a bit more detail on what the plan contains in relation to low carbon fuels, which is the policy area I'm working on. So this is basically a graphic uh, from the TDP, um, and it basically sets up quite nicely how cross-modal low carbon fuels are. So they're used across different transport modes. And there is a particular challenge also there for the future. In the moment, most of these low carbon fuels are used in road transport, but with electrification and um, the uptake of other zero emission vehicles, um, this balance will change in the long term. Um, these fuels will be increasingly needed in um, sectors harder to decarbonize, such as aviation which will require liquid fuels for much longer. So there's a big of a challenge in this area. In terms of the actual commitments on low carbon fuels, um, so the first one was to increase the main targets under the renewable transport fuel obligation, which sets um, an obligation on fuel suppliers to supply a certain share of renewable fuels. 
Um, the legislation on this was published last week, so it's on track for the 1st January 2022. The second commitment was to introduce E10 by September. It also happened, um, only with Northern Ireland to follow. The third one was to work with stakeholders on fuels with a higher biocontent than is typically included in standard petrol and diesel, and in particular in view of uh, vehicles that, can, um, that are compatible with these fuels. So we're thinking in particular about heavy goods vehicles here. Um, the fourth commitment is about um, additional actions in maritime and um, aviation, and that's a bit more set out on the next slide. Um, and the final one is to develop a low carbon fuel strategy for publication next year that looks a bit at the use of low carbon fuels um, across different transport um, uh, modes and set out a vision for the sector to 2050, given the transition I mentioned um, in the beginning. And just to get to the final slide, um, so this is just because I mentioned the additional commitments for maritime and aviation, so let's just summarize those. So for maritime, it's about including renewable fuels of non-biological origin, uh, mainly renewable hydrogen, for example. Um, in the renewable transport for fuel obligation. And for the aviation side, it's to start the commercialization of sustainable aviation fuels um, and consult on a mandate for those. Um, and this consultation was published as well in July. And this is a broad overview of everything. Um, if there are any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rina. It's a really interesting presentation there. And there's lots in there, that decarbonisation strategy, lots of different policy areas the government are looking at. And really interesting to see that the pathway to 2050 and how much there is to go in terms of decarbonising across our whole economy. But to understand further, let's go across to I'm from the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders to hear a little bit more about what motor manufacturers are thinking about, where they're investing, and what that's going to mean for how consumers power their vehicles in the future. Owen, over to you. Hi, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak at the Power Mobility and Convenience uh, Conference today. My name is Owen Mortimer. I'm the Technology and Innovation Manager at the Society for Motor Manufacturers and Traders. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about some developments in the electric vehicle uh, market in the UK and some of the developments around charging as well. I'm going to start by giving an overview of the UK policy context. We're already starting to see growth in sales of plug-in vehicles in the UK, and that's battery electric and plug-in hybrid vehicles. Uh, plug-in because they use an electric charging cable to uh, power a battery. So to meet the 2050 net zero carbon targets, the government has introduced several new targets to speed up the transition to zero emission transport in the UK. The large, the big one being, sorry, um, the phase out date of new petrol and diesel vehicles, which was announced at the end of last year. This date has been set at 2030, but there will be uh, five years, a transition period from 2030 to 2035, where all new cars and vans must be zero emission at the tailpipe. So for that five year period, there can still be some hybrid vehicles and the government is currently consulting on what type of vehicles should be allowed then. From 2030, any new cars and vans sold with tailpipe emissions must deliver significant zero emission capability. So this is the term they've used for the, uh, the hybrids uh, definition there. And again, these decisions only apply to new cars and vans. So existing ICE um, vehicles, so cars and vans, again, light vans, uh, can continue to be sold and driven, um, bought on the second hand uh, market, but not sold new. The number of, uh, there's a number of delivery mechanisms being used at the minute. Uh, the government is currently consulting, as I mentioned, uh, on a green paper on the post EU regulatory regime for CO2 emissions. Uh, so that will be uh, the legislation that sets the 2030 end of sale date. There's also um, a number of publications um, been uh, released recently, the end of sale um, delivery plan, which looks at how the government is going to meet that 2035 date, and the transport decarbonisation plan, which includes uh, proposals and consults, um, sorry, proposals to consult on a zero emission vehicle mandate in the UK, which is currently ongoing. I'm going to give a, a quick snapshot of the UK uh, market. Uh, recent SMT figures show the growth in uh, battery electric vehicles in recent years, and as you'll see uh, for the first half of this year, um, 
eight, the, 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 sorry, BEVs are reaching 8.1% of the market share. Um, we have to take into account the COVID, the impact of COVID on the industry. So there is a reduced market currently in terms of overall figures. But if you actually look at the, fi the figure of registrations right the way through from 2017, you can see that they are increasing as well. And this year is nearly matching uh, last year and it's only the first half. So we're expecting that figure to be higher this year and continue to grow over the next few years as the next slide shows. This, yes, yeah, so this, as I mentioned, this slide shows the uh, projected uh, growth in BEV and PHEV uh, over, the next, over the next year. And obviously, we know that uh, we need to be hitting 100% uh, sales of plug-in vehicles by 2030 and 100% battery electric, um, as it is, or zero emission vehicles, um, if another technology appears, by 2035 at the very latest. So we know we need to get to that point, and uh, this is just giving an eye for the next year. So I want to highlight some trends in vehicles um, and technologies that we're seeing in the industry in the minute, and then I'll move on to how uh, this is impacting on, on charging um, later on. But we are starting to see uh, the price of BEVs reducing, uh, more mass, uh, sorry, affordable mass market EVs, so across the different segments of the minute. Um, there are various projections um, point to mid-2020s as the point we'll see cost parity with uh, the ICE vehicle equivalents you know, ranging from 2024 all the way to 2030. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that, that those more affordable vehicles are coming. We're starting to see more choice in the battery uh, electric commercial vehicles as well. Um, requirements on kind of uh, clean air zones and city centres as well are, are pushing these, these developments. Um, but we're starting to see more options for slightly larger vans. We're seeing longer range um, batteries. So uh, electric vehicles that can drive further on a single charge. And this is also equating to larger um, range uh, electric PHEVs. So the, the portion of the driving that's done in electric can be done can be done for longer. We're also starting to see 800 volt architecture of electric vehicles, which means that they can charge much quicker. But we're also not not just in the electric se uh, sector. We're also seeing uh, developments in hydrogen fuel cells. Um, we're starting to see sort of the release of new he heavy goods vehicles in this area over the next few years, and the government is currently consulting on ending the sale of diesel and petrol heavy goods vehicles by 2040 in the UK. So we might see a lot more movement in that area in the next few years. We're also seeing a lot of uh, movement in the vehicle to grid and charging innovation space. Uh, so uh, wireless power transfer and things like that as well are happening and being trialled across the country and across Europe and the world. And we're also uh, now seeing um, a uh, vehicles being sold um, with product service bundles as well. So this is where uh, an OEM uh, sells a vehicle, but it also includes a membership to a certain electric vehicle charging network. Um, and we're seeing a lot more of that, and it's often uh, multiple networks and, and, and things like that. So that, that is, is a servitization um, of transport. So um, with these, these trends, we're starting to see uh, electric vehicles with larger batteries, which means larger ranges. Um, and with larger batteries and more energy dense batteries as well, uh, they require more energy. So this has an impact on, on charging and the charging requirements that those vehicles will need. And I'll touch on that now. This is just a, um, a visualization really. Um, again, it's just a visualization. I think it's uh, uh, not quite up to date given that the more uh, sorry um, more models coming to market all the time, but it shows you uh, the sort of increase in range of electric vehicles there, sort of moving on towards 350 and even now 400 and 450 mile uh, vehicles. This is just as well a list of uh, re a recently compiled list of OEM commitments in this area. So we know that in the UK, uh, 2035 is the date, the, the latest date that uh, petrol and diesel um, vehicles will be able to be sold, or albeit hybrids. Um, but this shows that a lot of the major OEMs uh, in Europe and the UK have made commitments to uh, go fully electric, either by 2030 or, or before. Uh, so that's just an overview there. And that'll bring, that brings us then on to uh, EV charging um, and the UK charging policy framework in the UK um, and the impacts that these trends are having on the charging market. Um, 
and and by charging i refer to uh, public charging obviously not not private charging on on people's driveways uh, given the the different kind of um technological requirements and, and obviously space requirements there but we are seeing new policy um in this area to improve the consumer experience and improve reliability of the charging points across the uk uh, the market seems to have converged on a ccs uh charging which is a combined charging standard um which can offer um AC and rapid DC charging. Uh, most vehicles are being released with CCS. Um, the other standard, main standard being CHAdeMO, uh, but fewer vehicles are being, uh, especially in Europe anyway, are being uh, released with that standard. Um, there's an in increasing number of high power charging infrastructure as well. So we're seeing uh, the impact of larger vehicle batteries and larger ranges being reflected in the charging market with charging points in the UK now, um, you know, of 150, to 350 kilowatt charging capabilities. Uh, and that's that's because, you know, we're seeing that the vehicles with the 800 volt capability. I'd like to point out there aren't many of those uh, that can, um, there aren't many yet in the UK, uh, but there will obviously be more. Uh, there aren't many vehicles that can charge with an 800 volt ca uh, capability, uh, but it points the direction the market will be going in. And um, I'm sure we'll be seeing more of those uh, in the future. Um, another, I've got a question there, it's the impact of electrification on heavier segments. Uh, we don't know uh, yet uh, which direction the, the HGV sector will go. You know, will it be fuel cell or will it be electric? Um, and if it is electric, you know, there may be some electric HGVs. What will the impact on charging be for that? Because they will need to be much quicker than um, more powerful than 350 kilowatts, um, given the likely size of the batteries there and the, the, the speed um, of power requirements that they will need. We've also seen uh, recent legislation on smart charge points as well. Um, so, um, you know, the functional definition and, and the requirement for interoperability of hardware, uh, cyber security, uh, and, and lots of other things there. Um, and this is seen as crucial uh, to the UK electricity grid. Um, a smart charging can, can help to reduce and delay the, the investment needed uh, in the electricity grid uh, by shaving off the peaks um, uh, of electricity demand. So yeah, this is just an overview of some of the funding that the government has committed uh, in this uh, space to the infrastructure. Um, overall, there's 1.3 billion has been um, uh, committed to accelerate the rollout of charging infrastructure. And there's a, a funding pot of 950 million for rapid charging fund. Um, and as you'll see, um, the, the, the aim of this fund is to install rapid charging uh, points all along motorways and major railroads um, at service stations in the UK. Uh, and there are a number of targets along the way towards um, towards those kinds of uh, figures. So by 2023, at least high, uh, six high powered, um, which is 150 kilowatt plus, um, uh, should will be installed um, across the UK. Um, and you know, from then on, we'll need to see see, see many more. Uh, this slide just highlights the importance of public charging infrastructure in the UK. Um, as you'll see there, even uh, though 80% of EV owners have access to home charging, 93% use still use the public <coughs> charging network. Um, so that will be, you know, if people are, are popping to the shops um, and are deciding to get a top up there, or if they're traveling like slightly longer distances and needing to stop at petrol stations and service stations uh, along the motorway, um, you know, the vast majority of people still use the public charging network. Um, and as it mentions there, only a third of dwellings um, and higher in, in cities, but London especially, uh, don't have off-street parking. So in the UK, public charging is very important. Uh, and again, even among dwellings with off-street parking, uh, an estimated 20% are unable to install a private home charger. So uh, whether it's grid, uh, grid restrictions, sorry, or any other issues, uh, it's not always possible to install a private charge point. So the public charging network is, is essential for the UK to, to meet its uh, uh, targets for zero emission transport by 2035. So cars and vans by 2035. This is some work um, that the SMMT has recently done, uh, some, some, some modeling, uh, which shows that we think um, the maximum amount of public charge points the UK would need to see uh, is about 2.3 million. Um, which might sound like a large figure, uh, but if you look at the amount of vehicles um, that will be coming and, and some of those figures that I've just shown, um, we need to make sure that people have access, uh, you know, easy access to high quality uh, public charge points in the UK. So if public charging preferences change, so for example, the move to more rapid charging, then obviously these figures will be lower um, or, or more, you know, more 
private charging. Um, but this is the kind of maximum that we're seeing. Um, and it's broken down there. So on streets, the kind of, uh, uh, sort of slower uh, vehicle charging um, that we're seeing in local authorities across the UK now. Uh, workplace, which is obviously isn't included as public, but could be a kind of hybrid system. Um, destination, uh, so uh, the retail um, sector, um, but also forecourts on motorways as well, which were, you know, as you're going down that grid, you'll be seeing higher speed uh, charging powers. Um, but yeah, so that it's, it's really essential um, that the UK has this network. And as you can see there as well, um, there needs to be a commitment and a coordinated plan to uplift the number of public charges um, of the right types in the right places. So that's matching the type of speeds in the areas that people want. You know, you don't want to be uh, stopping off at a service station and getting a seven kilowatt charger, which takes, you know, uh, even on an average uh, electric vehicle battery, 10 hours to charge. Uh, you want rapid charging. Um, and also, I think the, uh, the, as the points and the experience uh, make there, uh, reliability and ease of use are really important as well. So we need to see the electric vehicle charging network uh, working for everyone. Uh, if somebody shows up at electric vehicle charge point because they failed to plan ahead, perhaps, um, and that they, you know, they're running low on battery, they need to be able to know that they can just pull up and charge. Uh, in ease of payment as well, that's a really important uh, thing that people can just pay. Um, they don't have to have multiple memberships uh, it doesn't have to be hard to have a membership if that is the case. So, you know, there are a number of points there which can improve the experience uh, for users. So I wanted to finish off by reiterating the importance of a high density, high quality uh, charging network and the crucial role that the retail sector will play in helping the UK move towards a zero emission transport network. Thank you very much. Thank you, Owen, for those uh, insights in what might be coming down the pipeline in terms of new vehicle development and options for powering uh, vehicles in the future. That is going to be really interesting to see how all of those different forecasts you set out develop. So now we're going to go to our final presentation for this session from Tom at BP to look at some insights around where they're investing, how they see the future of the power and mobility market developing and what it might mean for fuel retailers. So, Tom, over to you. Uh, hi, and thanks very much for uh, having me today. Um, I'm Tom Callow, Head of Insight and External Affairs for BP POS, uh, one of the UK's um, leading providers of electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Um, I want to talk to you today uh, about electric vehicles on the forecourt and what role uh, forecourts play and will increasingly play uh, in the transition to electric vehicles that will happen not just in the UK, uh, but around the world. Um, so when we, um, when we look at electric vehicles, we, we kind of start off looking at the market. Um, and what's phenomenal in the UK is the acceleration uh, of electric vehicles uh, in you know, electric vehicles, particularly in the passenger car and, and van markets as uh, so the light duty market. Uh, and what this, this chart sort of shows you um, is basically the growth of electric vehicles over time from 2010, really sort of the, the modern era of electric vehicles, where they were, you know, sort of about 130 on the road uh, when I started doing this, uh, doing this stuff and, and talking about electric vehicles. Uh, to now there's well over there's over 600,000 on the road today so tremendous growth and you sort of see it sort of latter part of 2019 2020 um, what some people refer to as a sort of hockey stick growth uh, starting to happen so that real exponential curve kicking in uh, and starting to see much much higher levels of growth year on year um, so 2020 registrations were, were more than double uh, the year before and we're, we're on track not quite to double again this year uh, but, but certainly see a huge growth in 2021 uh, by the end of the year. So the forecast figures uh, from SMMT, for example, are that we'll see just shy of 300,000 electric vehicles registered this year. Uh, so at some point next year, we will hit the, the millionth electric vehicle on the road uh, sometime in 2022 in the UK. What's particularly interesting to us as a, as a charging business, um, we define electric vehicles as those vehicles that you can charge. Uh, at the moment, that's through, through predominantly through plugging them in. Uh, we have done some wireless charging before. Um, so electric vehicles include both plug-in hybrids and, and pure electric vehicles to us. Um, but there was obviously a bigger opportunity uh, with a pure electric vehicle to charge it because it has to charge, it needs to charge to move, uh, whereas a plug-in hybrid obviously can run off, off petrol or diesel. Uh, so the, the more interesting opportunity from a charging point of view is obviously pure electric. And what we're seeing in the, in, in, you know, at the moment and in, in the last sort of uh, 12 months or so is a real uh, steep growth of the pure electric vehicle market, which uh, before that had been you know, relatively modestly growing in the UK. So um, it had grown at a reasonable pace, but it certainly wasn't um, growing hugely quickly. Uh, whereas in the last sort of 12 months um, or 18 months or so, in fact, uh, the market's really shot up. And that's predominantly a, a factor of the taxation regime in the UK that makes running a pure electric car 
as a benefit in kind vehicle, a company car, uh, very, very cheap indeed. So you can see on these graphs that uh, the all EV markets, that's plug-in hybrid and pure EV, uh, really shooting up now, over 160,000 registrations a year to date in the UK. So again, uh, well on course for the sort of 280, uh, 260, 70, 80,000 by the end of the year. Uh, and pure electric vehicles, they're playing a really strong role in that, uh, that growth. Uh, with plug-in hybrids doing okay, um, but they are, they are just behind pure electric vehicles in terms of registrations this year. In terms of further looking further ahead, um, where we see the market in sort of 2030 is potentially, and, and nobody has a crystal ball here, or I, have, I must stress, but potentially a market of sort of over 11 million electric vehicles on the roads in the UK by, uh, by 2030. Um, and and what, we, what we sort of split that down by is what kind of uh, typology of vehicle there is there. So we've got your, obviously, obviously a van market there uh, and a car market and in the car space particularly, it's, it's that split between private ownership and, and fleet and lease. Uh, as well and is a huge sort of um, play for the fleet market um, in the coming years. So we see that shooting up and the fleet market playing a much stronger role in, in the EV, uh, EV market uh, by 2030. So the, the, the growth in our view over the next sort of five, 10 years is, is going to be driven by uh, fleet and lease vehicles and private. There will be lots of private motorists who adopt EVs, but the real core growth uh, is that fleet and lease market moving into EVs. And then you'll see the sort of longer tail of consumers adopt probably post 2030 potentially. Um, when it comes to um, sort of that fleet piece, um, we've actually done a recent piece of work uh, with a number of uh, other big businesses in the UK. Um, so we being BP Pulse, but part of BP, of course, um, the likes of sort of BT, Openreach, Tesco and so on, uh, looking at how fleets can accelerate uh, and unlock investment in electric vehicle infrastructure, particularly uh, and fleet um, demand over the next few years. And there's a few areas that we covered in that initiative, uh, which we reported to uh, back to as part of the uh, Prime Minister's um, Build Back Britain Better Council. Uh, one was around future-proofing electricity infrastructure. Um, so that's really about making sure distribution networks can invest ahead of time to make the infrastructure ready, the, the sort of what I call the below ground infrastructure ready for connections, uh, enabling the, the charging infrastructure to roll out, so enabling companies like us to accelerate a pace and actually get infrastructure in the ground much more quickly and much more effectively, overcoming some of the demand obstacles or perhaps perceived obstacles. So that's about consumer education. That's about ensuring that consumers can, can charge easily. And that's more about behavior and experience. And then finally, it's really around the supply side. So recognizing at the moment that we're in a supply constrained market. So nobody is struggling to sell electric vehicles at the moment. It's much more about ensuring supply is there. Uh, and that will certainly be met by a burgeoning demand at the moment. So fleet plays a massive role. Uh, and we've, we've highlighted that in the uh, EV fleet accelerator report, uh, which you can find online if you, if you go and have a look for it. When it comes to electric vehicle charging, which is obviously our, our business, um, we, we sort of refer to uh, the, the charging ecosystem, uh, the EV ecosystem, uh, for charging uh, and that ecosystem really is, is split into sort of um, a few areas so the, the key thing to understand about electric vehicles and how they are different from uh, internal combustion engine vehicles in our view is that electric vehicle charging happens in different places um, with, with refueling of petrol and diesel cars it predominantly happens in, in one type of place and that's called a forecourt um, but with electric vehicles uh, it, it really is going to be a more diverse experience for lots of people and um, there'll be some people that, that exclusively charge at home particularly lower mileage vehicles so um, you know, I have a vehicle on my driveway that does um, 5,000 miles a year, and that particular vehicle will probably only have to be charged at home, to be honest with you. Uh, another one, uh, the other vehicle on my driveway does more like 30,000 miles a year, and that will do lots of public charging and some workplace charging too. Uh, but you've got home charging there, predominating at the moment, probably 70, 70 80 percent of charging being at home at the moment. Workplaces are playing an increasingly important role because they're somewhere that cars spend a lot of time doing nothing. Uh, you know, we know that private cars, particularly in the UK, spend over 90 percent, maybe 95 percent of their time parked. Uh, when a vehicle is parked, it's a great time to charge it. Um, if vehicles were driving all over the place all the time, uh, there'd be far less opportunity to charge them. But as it is, there's actually plenty of opportunities to get uh, particularly cars and, and vans as well charged in the UK uh, in that downtime. And then we split uh, public or on-the-go charging into two categories. Uh, one of those is what we call destination charging. So that's very much about um, where charging is, is, is happening, where you would stop, any, stop in any, anyway. So you're stopping at a car park, you're stopping at the supermarket, for example, and you're happening to charge there, but you're not going there to charge, you're going there for something else and charging is, is also available. And then for the faster forms of charging, so rapid knowledge fast charging, which I'll define in a minute for you, um, is really uh, sort of more mission driven charging. So that's where you're going somewhere to charge, uh, a forecourt hub, for example, that's your mission. You're going there to charge your vehicle quickly. And obviously you want some convenience uh, and some other um, sort of um, facilities available to you, but your, your sort of core mission is actually going to charge rather than going to shop or go to the cinema or what have you. And when we talk about those different um, sort of types of charging, 
um, I sort of like to break them down and have a think about how many miles of range you could typically get in, in a period of time. So I've picked seven minutes here because that's uh, sometimes cited as the sort of average end to end time that someone spends on a forecourt. So that's from the time they drive in to the time they drive off. And that includes obviously getting out of the car, pumping the fuel, uh, you know, going into the shop, queuing, et cetera, et cetera. And so seven minutes is a you know, short enough time to, to be quick, but it's, uh, it's long enough potentially to get a decent charge on the fast form of charging. So when it comes to, for example, four courts and the role that they might play, uh, the, the sort of top forms of charging here, the slower forms of charging really aren't going to be appropriate for a four court. You're not going to get much range uh, in the sort of times that people are accepting to accept, um, people are happy to stop in the four court for. Once you go into ultra fast charging, which is what we're rolling out now on BP four courts and in new hub destinations, um, you're really seeing a, a pretty good level of charge in just six, you know, seven minutes or so. So on a current 150 kilowatt charger, maybe you can see about 70 odd miles of range in that time. And on the 300 kilowatt chargers that will be coming out on our network very soon, uh, you, know, you could be talking about 140 miles of range in seven minutes. So very, very respectable, enough to get you um, a very long way in your vehicle and probably need to stop again for a, for a sort of a biological break. Uh, rather than anything else. So um, you know, we really want to emphasize that the, the fastest forms of charging are where we see that alignment with, with four quarts today, uh, just like you have a fast um, fast refueling time for a petrol and diesel car. So we're rolling out those ultra fast chargers. We are at the moment, um, it's PP Pulse, um, the UK's most used public charging network. Um, we think we'll power around about 100 million miles of electric, electric driving by the end of this year on our public charging network. So you know, there's, there's lots more going on at home. There's lots of charging going on at work. But that's just on our public charging network alone. And that's that's double what we powered last year. So obviously 2020 was a strange year for most of us. Um, about 50 million uh, electric miles powered last year, but we think we'll hit around about 100 million electric miles this year. So that's rough, roughly about 30 million kilowatt hours of charging, um, which is a really impressive uh, amount of energy to be providing, um, particularly in the context of people worrying about you know, not, uh, not being you know, public charging points, for example. Um, we're really sort of strong on, on sort of contactless and easy, easy access. So we've got more contactless enabled rapid chargers and ultra fast charge than any network. So that's where you can just tap and pay with your normal bank bank card or maybe Apple Pay, an Apple Watch or an, or an iPhone, for example. Um, and we're really focused on, as I say, the faster forms of charging. So we've gotten just shy of 100 ultra fast chargers, that's USCs today on a network, I'm ramping up to doubling that by the end of the year and then 700 plus by 2025. And several thousand by 2030, so at least 1600 by 14, sorry, 1400 by 2030. Realistically, it's probably going to be more than that by 2030, given the demand for that type of charging. Um, and as I say, we 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 sort of we we think that the fast forms of charging are what consumers want in terms of that convenience. And um, something else that consumers really strongly uh, feedback on with electric vehicles is they don't just want charging to be fast; they want it to be clean. So, um, what they want electricity to be is is renewable or renewably sourced, uh, backed and certified renewable energy. Um, so that when they're refueling their electric car with, with electricity, they feel they're doing it in the cleanest possible way. So that's something we uh, we bear in mind in our network as well when we think about certifying all of our network ut utilisation uh, with renewable uh, energy as well, renewable energy certificates. So moving on specifically to uh, the opportunity of four courts. Um, the key starting point for us is, is, looking at, um, is looking at how and where people might need to charge. So. Um, it's estimated that around about 40% of drivers uh, will not be able to have access to home charging. So um, home charging obviously is, is positioned as a, as a really major feature of the electric vehicle market, uh, but there'll be lots of people who can't do that. And when it comes to the alternatives and what you can do instead, you've got the likes of on-street charging, plugging into a lamppost maybe, uh, but realistically these things pose pretty big challenges now for you. So you've got safety challenges, um, you've got potential trip hazards there, you've got uh, cars that aren't electric vehicles parking in front of them because they don't realize what they are. So actually, it can be quite a hassle, uh, this on-street charging, because people don't necessarily uh, aren't, aren't always able to use the infrastructure in the right way um, when they need it. So uh, on-street charging is something that we, we have done in, in, in pockets, and we believe fundamentally in the sort of mass market, you have to provide that fast form of charging, convenient charging for uh, people to adopt electric vehicles. So when you think about the opportunity, um, you know, four courts already provide a convenience for customers. They already provide somewhere to go, a shop. Um, you know, somewhere you can go and get a, a, a quick, have a quick visit, buy a coffee, buy a sandwich, uh, you know, buy, read the paper, etc. Uh, they already provide that today, so it aligns well with an electric vehicle in terms of, sort of dwell time and mission. Uh, and obviously, they're used to serving customers. So unlike putting a charging point on the side of the road, it's completely unmanned and remote. And um, if you put a charging point in a suit in a, in a forecourt, um, you've got the opportunity to make it quite a similar experience to someone filling up at a petrol or diesel pump today. So it's a piece of infrastructure that you use, and you've got facilities there on site as well. Um, 
but as well as the opportunity, there's potentially also a bit of stick here as well as the carrot. So there, there is uh, legislation on the horizon uh, that may well force larger uh, forecourts to actually um, man mandate this technology to be in place. So it might be that large forecourts are probably likely that large forecourts will have to have electric vehicle charging on site as well. Um, can pose, it, this can sort of pose significant challenges, so particularly on space. And we see significant challenges around the space that uh, ultra fast charging requires, for example, sometimes on some sites. Um, but we're looking at you know, innovative technologies to help us with that. So uh, on screen here is the, the uh, free wire boost charger that we uh, have a, a sort of USP on for the UK market. And that's a, I've got a huge battery inside, basically. It takes a very small grid supply, so not much more than you have at your, uh, in your domestic property. And it basically scales that up, transforms that up to an ultra fast output. So it can ultra fast charge vehicles uh, through its connectors but actually it doesn't require a huge grid infrastructure under it and it can be moved quite easily. So if you put it on a forecourt, if you then move the forecourt down the road, if you sell that site, you can actually move the charger quite easily with you. Uh, also really useful in rural areas where grid connections might be more expensive or much more difficult to, um, to procure as well. Um, the other great thing about ultra fast charging is the utilization. So um, we're seeing the highest levels of utilization on this type of charging. Uh, the, the charge on the left there, so one of those charges, for example, now Hammerson site in London, we've seen that do well over 700 kilowatt hours in a day, uh, absolutely no problem. Um, whereas the, the charge points sort of in on the street, the slower charging lamppost charge, that kind of thing, could well be looking at more like seven kilowatt hours a day. So you might need a hundred of those charges just to give you the same level of utilization as an ultra fast charger. Um, so even if even if the charges were used maybe at 30% capacity per day, an ultra fast charger could be doing about a thousand kilowatt hours of charging a day. You know, that's that's 10 huge Tesla batteries. Uh, whereas a single uh, on street charger could probably only be doing about 40 kilowatt hours, which is sort of less than half the big Tesla battery. So uh, the, the magnitude of all uh, between those two things in terms of impact uh, is quite significant. Obviously, electric vehicles are one technology. Uh, there are other technologies um, that people talk about. Um, one of those things is hydrogen. So, you know, is there of hydrogen on forecourts? And there's already a couple of forecourts in the UK that do have hydrogen pumps. Uh, they're quite big. So the picture here shows you that um, the, the hydrogen infrastructure there sort of uh, highlighted in red. Uh, on this, this is a, one of the UK's largest forecourts. Uh, you can see how bit, how much space that takes up, and that's just one hydrogen pump, so that can just serve one one car at a time. Um, so you'd only really be, really be able to get maybe five or six on that site uh, in, in that sort of um, in that sort of scale. Um, they also sort of take time to refill. And the, one of the biggest arguments uh, sort of on hydrogen for passenger cars is that it's quite inefficient. So, for example, the, the Toyota Mirai, uh, which you know, even Toyota describes as a sort of laboratory on wheels rather than a, a sort of a serious production car. Um, to people to buy, um, it, the efficiency of that vehicle is about one mile per kilowatt hour of electricity. So obviously you need electricity to make hydrogen. And as a result of that process of creating electricity to make hydrogen, um, you get about one mile per kilowatt hour of efficiency. Whereas in a, something like a Tesla uh, or the car that I drive, you're looking more like sort of four, three, four, five miles per kilowatt hour. So you get much more efficiency out of an electric car uh, powered by electricity rather than a hydrogen car powered by hydrogen that has to come from electricity basically. So I think sort of the, the, the role for hydrogen for passenger cars is looking um, pretty, pretty niche, to be honest, for the future, where hydrogen could well play a role as for heavier vehicles. So um, despite various companies suggesting that they can electrify huge sort of 44 tonne trucks, um, I think there's a lot of people that still believe that the, the really heavy duty market uh, is, is much more likely to be hydrogen uh, based than elect electrified. But, you know, we'll see because they, that market really hasn't matured yet. Um, but hydrogen could well play a role in that heavier market. Um, in terms of the, the, the successes of ultra fast charging and where we are investing, um, so creating ultra fast charging on forecourts. So, uh, the BP uh, flagship site in Hammersmith, for example, uh, was awarded the charging destination of the year last year. Um, it's got five chargers there, uh, heavily utilized, as I say, probably one of the most uh, used public charging locations in the UK. So, certainly increasing our investment in these sites. Uh, we've already got um, sort of over 90 uh, such chargers installed on forecourts. And as I say, we're, we're basically trying to put these charges down on any of our forecourts where, where it is actually feasible to do so. Um, some of the challenges around costs. So one of the good things recently last week was announced that um, the UK regulator, so Ofgem, is actually going to be lowering grid connection costs for electric vehicle charging. That's good news, getting rollout happening quicker. And also uh, some welcome news around potentially being able to get more charges at motorway services where people really need them as well. And in terms of the future around opportunities and where we're looking to on the horizon, uh, it's really around complementary solutions and complementary offers. So really um, maintaining commitment to the forecourts and actually finding as many forecourts as possible, but also recognizing that you've got things like space limitations on forecourts. So actually there's a need for different types of infrastructure out there. Uh, and we're building hubs like this on along the strategic road networks. So this is a uh, 300 kilowatt charging hub where you've got 300 kilowatt chargers, uh, 24 bays, so potentially uh, 24 vehicles can be charging at the same time. Uh, and this will be just off uh, a mainstream motorway in the UK. So you've got driver lounge. It's, it's, it's not dissimilar from a forecourt today, but 
doesn't have any petrol diesel on site. So it's an EV only hub, and that's really going to complement the forecourt offers that we have. Uh, and as I say to people, we know, yes, well, it's very exciting. We're going to have 10, 12 million electric cars on the road by 2030. Uh, but what that equally means is that we're going to at least have 10, 12, if not uh, more like 20 million petrol diesel cars on the road by 2030. So forecourt's going to have to keep a balance uh, for the coming years about their servicing both electric vehicle and uh, petrol and diesel car customers. Uh, so that was hopefully a, a helpful run through uh, what the opportunity on forecourts is. Uh, and um, thanks very much for your time. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tom, for that presentation and to OI and to Verena for their insights as well. What is really clear from those presentations is a huge amount of change coming down the line. A once in a generation change for how we power uh, vehicles and, and think about mobility in our society. But there's also lots of opportunities, I think, for fuel retailers to embrace this change and not just fuel retailers, but all retailers, convenience retailers, uh, across the whole sector, um, because I was really struck by what Tom set out in his presentation around the different charging um, missions. So there were those home missions, the workplace missions, the destination and the rapid charge for us all to think about. I also think from OI, and we saw that manufacturers are, are really focused on EV uh, by 2030. There was very clear commitments from lots of his members in that space, both in the mass market and vehicle fleets. So that's a, a real clear direction of travel we have to work with. And finally, from Verena, we, we saw the absolutely crucial role that government's going to play in investment in infrastructure to deliver all this. So well, there's lots to work at and what, lots to go through. So let's get the panel back and, and have a chat with them about some of those, uh, some of those issues. So please um, have a think now, look at, at the chat box and think about the questions that you want to ask to Owen from the Society of Manufacturing and Motor Traders from Verena from Department for Transport and Tom from BP Pulse. But I'm going to kick us off um, uh, just by talking. We're going to talk a lot about EV. So I want to just, before we go there, let's talk about some of the alternative uh, powering options. And Verena, I want to start with you because your, your key focus is actually around low carbon fuels. And there's sort of two key defining policies in that area at the minute. It's government's rollout of E10 as the standard fuel uh, rate and also the RTFO targets increasing so how, how how's e10 rollout gone what's what's the thinking in dft around around that and and you mentioned the low carbon fuel strategy coming forward do you think as part of that we're going to see the rtfo targets go further um, and increase more yeah i mean it's a good point um so i mean the, the important thing to highlight when we're talking about low carbon fuels is i mean we heard about all the new commitments for electric vehicle and they will be really important to meet net zero. But even as we ban the sale of new petrol diesel cars, there will still be those old petrol diesel cars on the road. And we also need to think about how we decarbonize them further. So that's where the role for low carbon fuels is. Any 10, as you said, is a crucial part of that. It's one of the few steps that we could still do in creating the bio content without having to adapt infrastructure significantly. And um, yeah, I mean, we, we're still, I mean, it's still early days, so it's two weeks. I mean, we haven't yet any data in, but I think from what we've heard anecdotally, it's been going well. Maybe some of the members here have differently, but um, that's basically the feedback that we received so far. And on the RTFO target increases, I mean, yes, we increased them now, and um, we will need to do further carbon savings in this sector. So, I mean, it might not be the last time that we raise targets, but I mean, that depends on the evidence that comes forward in the future and it needs to be possible to increase those targets. I mean, what we've seen with E10, that's what I said, is once one of the last, let's say, low hanging fruits. If you're now coming to blend walls where it's become more difficult, you need to also think about the infrastructure that is attached to it if you want to increase the biofuel content, for example, further, or you have some drop in fuels, but they're, you know, very much, the costs are much higher. So there's a few more considerations to do. And yeah, and it's, we need to make sure that any carbon savings we deliver are cost effective as compared to other options. Sure, and of course, sustainable in terms of how we deliver that exactly. higher blend. So we're not, you know, impacting land use in that process. So really interesting to see the low carbon fuel strategy come forward and what that might mean. Um, the other area that both Owen and Tom talked about was around hydrogen. Um, and we seem to be 
uh, both of you, um, I'll start with Owen, thinking that, you know, hydrogen isn't really an option for four core um, uh, power. Uh, and, and Tom had set out some of the reasons why that might be in terms of the size of the infrastructure. So is that what your members are thinking, Owen, in terms of it's, it's too difficult? Uh, that's, that's where they are at the moment. Well, I think with um, with hydrogen, yeah, I think with the, the passenger car, it seems to um, have already moved towards battery electric. Um, there's been a mass move there, um, you know, mass, uh, sorry, a vast majority of OEMs are producing battery electric and not going for hydrogen fuel cell. Um, but the, uh, as Tom mentioned as well, uh, fuel cell does, or hydrogen fuel cell does seem to kind of lend itself better to heavy goods vehicles due to the space needed for the, the fuel tanks and things like that and the range they can get. Um, you know, there are questions, as uh, Tom mentioned, about efficiency, but I think for HGVs, uh, it's certainly uh, an, a prominent option. Uh, but the passenger car um, may play a role, but uh, probably not a large role. Think of them OK, and Tom, you probably agree with that. So passenger car, not a role. But nonetheless, if we've got this HGV target um, for, for the HGV, the ending of HGV is ICE vehicles, doesn't that mean that fuel retailers are still going to have to think about investing in the infrastructure, hydrogen infrastructure? I think it's entirely possible that you'll see uh, hydrogen infrastructure for, for very heavy goods vehicles, you know, sort of 44 tonne articulated lorries and so on. Things like motorway service areas where you have the sort of dedicated lanes for those, such vehicles today. Um, I think in terms of your sort of average uh, sort of suburban forecourt, for example, um, you know, probably unlikely today to be seeing those kind of vehicles coming through uh, as, as sort of customers, you know, more likely being seen some things up sort of seven and a half tonne, maybe rigid, et cetera. Um, and that for that market, it feels like um, you know battery electric probably for sort of shorter range vehicles, sort of uh, urban interurban use probably is more appropriate. And um, when you're looking at sort of you know cross continental or very long distance vehicles, um, looks like hydrogen might play more of a role there. And therefore, the, the infrastructure they'll be using is more like to be on sort of motorway networks, etc. So it's probably a case of actually it's not necessarily that it's not a choice, and we won't, so we won't see on four courts, but we probably won't see it on certain types of forecourts given sort of space requirements and so on and so forth it's probably going to appear on those sort of strategically located motorway sites that will sort of enable a uh, sort of uk-wide hydrogen network to establish itself if that's if that's indeed required um so yeah i, I think it's it, I, I see hydrogen playing a role um and i certainly don't think it's uh, certainly not we, we haven't certainly done that today but certainly don't think it's helpful that we see some people sort of um trying to predict what we you know that it won't happen um i think we sort of need to be open-minded about the future and, uh, and in terms of what technologies will emerge yeah, thanks. And I think one of the key challenges here is we're seeing all different parts of this decarbonisation strategy from government trying to come together. And, and so, so those larger vehicles, obviously, there's talk around how we decarbonise the last mile consolidation hubs for delivering the last mile. That's all going to have to be part of this bigger picture for our transport network in the future. OK, well, let, let's go on to EVs and EV um, take up. And um, I was really struck by the figures around EV registrations. So you both Tom and Owen said that they're, they're, they're growing significantly, but actually of the 35 million cars in the market, only 1.3% are sort of plug-in vehicles at the moment. So it's still quite a really small segment. So Owen, what, you know, in your graph, you've a really steep increase in EV uptake. What will determine the sort of steepness of that uptake? What, what, what do you think are the key things? I mean, Tom mentioned benefit in kind and subsidies. What, what do you think is going to be determined the steepness of that curve? Yeah, um, well, I think, um, as I mentioned, I think fleets are important, you know, they play a, a big uh, kind of proportion of, of new registrations, but I think mainly um, at the minute still, we're still at a very early phase, and I think the consumer um, grants, you know, the, the plug-in car grants at the minute are playing, still play an important role. Um, you know, lots of surveys are showing as well that um, confidence in the charging infrastructure network is important, so I think Probably from a perspective point of view, I'd imagine uh, that the uh, consumer grants at the minute are still important and the kind of price of running an electric vehicle um, uh, is, a, is, a, is a big draw uh, for consumers. And I also imagine, you know, the kind of perceived nature of, of how good the charging uh, infrastructure is as well. Okay, so Tom, we've still got a problem then with the perception around EV infrastructure. Is it, is it not good enough? Is that, is that where the problems really lie? You said a crucial word in that answer, Ed, which was perception. Um, well, yes, we've got a problem with perception, um, and that's something that we, the industry is working on in terms of educating the market and, and showing what's possible. Um, you know, uh, there's, there's a vast amount of headroom in the existing electric vehicle charging infrastructure that's out there. Uh, at any one moment in time, you know, uh, you know, you'd probably see a peak utilisation of maybe around 20% of all the charge points in the country at absolute peak. So there's effectively always sort of 70, 80% availability on, on the network as a whole. So we certainly have you know, if you look at the national level, certainly pockets where we need more infrastructure, there's areas of the country that, that 
you know, do not have enough infrastructure today. We, we can't shy away from that and we shouldn't be dishonest about that. Um, but generally speaking, it's rolling out a pace. The amount of infrastructure is going in the ground is good and so on. And I think what the issue around the perception of infrastructure is very much a about you know, education and, and making people sort of see what their duty cycle would be, for example. There'll be lots of vehicles that never need to charge on the public charging network, for example. And that's something I don't think consumers have got their head around yet. If they can plug in at home, a lot of vehicles will, will only ever charge at home and will never be a sort of a charging opportunity elsewhere, for example. But that doesn't mean they won't be on the forecourt. I'm one of those people. I had a, you know, had a charging point in my previous property. I haven't got one installed in my new house yet, but you know, I still visited a forecourt. I'm going to get, I've got a, the ability to charge at home. Uh, you know, at the end of today, I'm, at, I'm off-site at the moment. I'm going to be going past the BP forecourt, stopping and buying dinner for tonight. Um, so it's, you know, that's, that's a forecourt sort of opportunity for the shop, um, but I'm not a fuels customer. So you'll still get that customer potentially as a, a, as, a um, as, as footfall. Uh, but no, I think in terms of charging, it's much more about perception than reality. And that's certainly what we're, we're trying to sort of uh, help educate the market about. Okay. So Verena, do, does the government need to do more in terms of perception then around this? Do we need to be more confident about our infrastructure? Because we've got the Go, the Go Ultra, Ultra Low advertising campaign, but do we need to ramp that up? Do we need to do more to, to give people confidence? Um. Given that there's not my policy area, I don't want to go into too much on it. But I mean, from I mean, it's definitely an area where there is work ongoing. And um, I mean, we see probably the same that I mean, what we see is the UK is very much at the forefront of building up this infrastructure. And yeah, there might well be that you know communications. And but also, it's also about gaining. It's not just about communications campaigns. I mean. Because from my experience of working on E10, I mean, it's not that you necessarily reach every single person, even if you do quite an extensive campaign. And it's also about that slowly needing to get through. And, you know, the more you maybe also see people with experience and have people in your, you know, you know, friends and acquaintances that have positive experience that will also influence you. I mean, it's not just about <laughs> one campaign being able to resolve all of those questions. And if I, if, if, I, if I may take the liberty just to sort of answer the question you posed to Owen as well about kind of what the steep, the steep curve, the, the biggest thing that can change is supply. It's a supply constrained market at the moment. Um, if you read the mainstream media, it suggests it's a demand problem. Not enough consumers want electric cars. That's not actually where we are. We're at a point where lots of people want them and actually the supply isn't there to deliver all the electric cars to people that do want them. So when someone says to me the other day, well, Tom, how do you feel that only 25% of people want an electric car as an X car, I actually said, I'm not bothered because there isn't a supply for that for that 25% to get them anyway at the moment. We need more vehicles coming to market. Um, and that that you know that supply will certainly be mopped up. And there's no OEM out there that's struggling to sell electric cars at the moment. Uh, so we are in a supply constrained market, not a demand constrained one. So the one thing that will increase the steepness of the curve is very simply supply at the moment. That's the one thing you could do to increase the uptake of EVs in the UK is actually put more into the market. Okay, so oh, you need more, we need more. How are your how are your members going to deliver more? What, what what's the what's the barriers to them delivering more? Um, well, I think that the last couple, the last year, um, the last sort of eighteen months has has kind of impacted on the market massively. So COVID um, and some of the changes uh, in regulation and Brexit um, have kind of slowed down uh, some of the, the the trade and the supply in the UK. I think the semiconductor issue due to COVID is is proving a big issue, which I think will continue. I think it's looking like until the early twenty twenty two. Um, but, you know, hopefully once these issues uh, are smoothed out, um, the market can rebound. Um, I think that the OEMs themselves have made the commitments to bring or to, to start producing and marketing these vehicles more. Uh, so we'll definitely be seeing uh, more vehicles coming to market. And hopefully once this kind of uh, difficult 18 months is out of the way, we can see that happening quite quickly. OK. And one of the innovations you talked about uh, in your presentation was around wireless charging as an option yeah. for uh, vehicles. What? What do you see for the trajectory of that trajectory of that? Because obviously for fuel retailers out there, that's that's got some pretty big implications for how they deliver that infrastructure on their sites. Yeah, I mean at the minute I wouldn't worry too much about wireless. I think it's it's never gonna be or you never never say never, but it's never gonna be as um, efficient as inductive charging or conductive charging, sorry, so as, as with a cable. Um, it's unlikely uh, to take off uh, uh, the minute um, beyond sort of trials or in small areas for areas that it might you know, very specific circumstances, I suppose. In some circumstances, it may be in buses uh, or something like that, uh, where, you know, there's a regular kind of uh, movement over inductive pads and, and, and that kind of thing. So very specific um, uh, examples. But, um, you know, yeah, we will continue to see innovations in lots of these areas in charging and battery technology in the vehicles themselves. 
uh, fuels, um, you know, in all these areas. So but I think it looks like the market has moved, obviously moved towards kind of the wired charging. So wireless might play a role, but it probably won't play a large role, uh, in, at least in the near to medium term, I'd imagine. Okay. So looking more widely at charging infrastructure, I sense a bit of attention between Tom and Owen in terms of the picture of what charging infrastructure might look like. So Owen, you talked about 2.3 million, million public charges as a max, the cost yeah. of the three point, no, sorry, 17.6 billion. And then Tom, you talked more about moving towards fast charging, well, 100 kilowatt charging to 300 foot kilowatt charging. So, so where are we going to end up, Tom? You're saying there's actually a fast charging market is the place we're going to be, and that's going to work well for fuel retailers. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, the first thing I'd echo from a presentation is that nobody has a crystal ball. So, so I'm, I, I can't claim to be right, and, and neither can Aaron, and no, nobody can. So, if someone says they know exactly what the infrastructure is going to look like, they're lying. Um, so, we, nobody knows, but the, what we can do is look at some data. And what we see at the moment um, across the UK charging networks, we can't see all our competitors' data, but we do have ours, obviously. Um, is that the, the vast majority of, the moment of, of actual charging events and energy being delivered is going through that fast form of charging. So last year, if you look at the charging estate we have, it's, a, it's getting on for a thousand of those sort of rapid and ultra fast chargers uh, out of a total uh, of about 8,000, that's sort of sockets and so on. So once you actually look at devices, and um, you're looking at sort of more like 5,000, so let's say sort of a fifth effectively, 20% of the devices are, are rapid and ultra fast and the rest are slower. 70%, 70% of all public charging on network last year was on those rapid notch fast chargers. So that, that they're delivering, if you like, they're the foot soldiers of, of the charging infrastructure uh, and slower charging is kind of there as almost a, a sort of a, an enabler for other people. Um, I think it's um, politically quite challenging. It's probably gonna be quite disruptive in terms of all the work's going on to put on-street charging absolutely everywhere. Um, you know, you'd have a limited opportunity to do it on a, any given road anyway. Um, you know, you couldn't put it in every, even if you put it in every single lamppost, you know, there might only be three lampposts on, on a road for, you know, 50, 50 to 100 people, for example. So, you're, you know, in terms of that availability of charging, the comp, we're talking about confidence people want. Um, at the moment, that people are very familiar with that opportunity of going and quickly charging somewhere. So if you, if you can't charge at home, our view is that you're more likely to look at that opportunity to charge quickly and confidently somewhere, know you're fully charged or know you're charged to 80%, you can go to where you need to go and you're done, rather than sort of driving home from work and thinking, oh, I really want, I wonder if that charging point outside my house is going to be free tonight to use. You know, I, I don't think that's what the consumer mindset's going to be, to be honest. Okay. And Owen, do, you, do your members see an opportunity or a, a role that they can play in the charging infrastructure? You mentioned around servicization and bundles of, with car manufacturers thinking, we see partnerships like Ford and Centrica in terms of mm. their, their provision. Is that is that something that, car manufacturers are going to be looking to working with fuel retailers and different network providers to provide infrastructure for charging? Yeah, definitely. I think it's going to be something they look at to do more. Um, um, obviously, we need to make sure that the uh, infrastructure network is, is kind of easily accessible to everyone. Um, just to sort of uh, touch on Tom's point, I think there'll be a spread of different speed chargers. Um, I think, you know, you need to be targeting kind of make, yeah, there's a change of behaviour and also a kind of making sure that the consumers have what they want as well with with these um, things so you know increasing home charging as well so people can trickle charge at slower rates overnight slower public charging but also you know making sure that people have the option to charge um quickly um uh, on four courts um but yeah i do i do think that you know um the oems will be working are, are working hard with kind of um, consortiums to kind of roll out this infrastructure and are playing a part in that as well okay good well Tom, I wanted to talk about, you talked about opportunities for, um, uh, for fuel retailers and you set out a really positive picture around destination and rapid and ultra fast charging. So tell us what, about your driver hubs, uh, driver lounge, what, what, what they look good and how you become an award winning provider of uh, driver hubs. Yeah, so the, the new hubs we're developing, the first one of those will be going, uh, is, is sort of uh, in, in progress, hasn't been developed yet. Um, in terms of the charging that we've got on site on existing forecourts, uh, you know, we've, where, where we have the space available, we've put ultra fast chargers down. Uh, obviously, they're already at sites that have got you know, a good offer in terms of, you know, the MS Simply Food, Wellbeing Cafe, etc. There's somewhere you can get to the toilet, grab a coffee, get Wi Fi, uh, grab a seat, for example. Um, it's not, it isn't sort of rocket science. So you don't necessarily have to think about redeveloping your entire site to cater for electric vehicle drivers. It's about sort of, you know, changes and tweaks that you can make to get uh, more people in. We've already seen uh, the likes of MFG, for example, convert and convert a site. Uh, either to um, EV charging. So there's a new MFG site that was announced recently with, with only EV charging on and the convenience offer. We'll see more of that kind of thing, I'm sure. 
Um, so it's really about sort of focusing yeah, on, the, on the customers you've got and clearly the type of forecourt you are. If you're a forecourt today that's seeing mostly older vehicles, you know, privately owned, for example, you're probably not going to see EV adoption come up so highly. If you're a forecourt today that's serving a lot of fleet drivers, a lot of newer vehicles, uh, then you're probably going to see more EVs in your forecourt more quickly. So, you know, there are forecourts that are going to have to, have to sort of adapt sooner and, and cater for those vehicles much more quickly than others that will have a bit more time to adapt. Excellent. I'm sure useful uh, thoughts there for the, for the next panel that we come on to. Um, before we go and finish up, Bruni, I want to come to you and talk about just in terms of the policy projection here. So actually what was quite striking was about the scale of the challenge that we face ahead. And it seems that actually the costed policies we have only take us not even halfway to the 2032 target for carbon emissions. So are we going to see big changes, uh, further big announcements from the Department for Transport around how we meet these zero emission targets that will that significantly change investment plans for fuel retailers in the future? Um, I mean, the, the big announcement right now was the TDP, and it was about basically setting out a plan for 2020. So I don't think there's, a, you know, apart from what was announced in there, right now, that is the government policy going forward. But we also, I think, we're clear that it is a first step. And as evidence develops, as, you know, we see what technologies come forward, that will need to be also amended and adapted. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's not like uh, there will not be a big package like this next year again. No. <laughs> okay. Well, look, we've got to finish it there. I wanted to just give Tom and Owen and, and Marina thanks, great thanks for your insights and sharing your time with us. It's greatly appreciated. Uh, hopefully you can hang on for the rest of the panels and, and we'll forward on any questions to you, but thank you very much for your time. We're going to go to the break now um, and come back later for the panel with Sarah. So please could everyone be back at uh, 10.50 for the next session, uh, 10.50 for the next session. So thank you very much to our speakers in this first panel. Hope you found that useful. And thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Welcome back. I hope you had time to grab a coffee. So in our first session, we heard more about the government's decarbonisation plan, moving to make the UK a greener place to live and securing the future for our children. We've had a glimpse of what the future holds in terms of electric vehicles, and there's no doubt they're here to stay, with more and more manufacturers committing to them. This means that there's going to have to be a rise in the number of charging points needed to ensure that we can all continue on our journeys with minimal interruptions. So what does this all mean to the forecourts themselves and especially the convenience shops on site? Firstly, we're gonna hear from Alexandra Copeland from Apple Green, who is going to share her vision of the future of convenience on forecourts. Then we'll hear from Tom Dant at Jillmarsh Forecourts, who will give us an overview of his stores. And then we'll head over to Northern Ireland, where Damien Nevin will show Patrick Saw around his new site. So firstly, over to you, Alexandra. Good morning, everyone. I'm pleased to be here today on this conference and be able to present my view on the future of convenience retail and petrol forecourt. My name is Alexandra Copeland. I am a Regional Operations Manager for Apple Green. Currently, I oversee operations on service stations across the UK North and Midlands region. Prior to joining Apple Green, I worked for two out of the top four supermarkets in the UK. For the last 15 years, retail and especially convenience has not only been my career, but also my passion. I guess we all asking ourselves the question, where is the future heading? With constantly changing and improving our life technology, convenience has become a top priority on everyone's agenda. In my presentation, I will focus on trends in forecourt retail and how the retailers are responding to those trends. Also, I will look into the future responses and how will they shape the future of stores and the forecourts. Before we discover a vision of a future, let's remind ourselves how it all began. The first filling station was the city pharmacy in Germany back in 1888. The pharmacies sold gasoline as the side business. The world first filling station was constructed in St. Louis, Missouri in 1905. And the first filling station in the UK was opened in November 1919 in Berkshire. It was a single hand operated pump. 
Let's see what the industry is now. Uh, currently, we have 8,380 fuel for cut sites across the UK, and out of those, 7,398 have shops. On the right hand side on the top corner, you can see a graph with a number of petrol fill in stations in the UK between 1970 and 2012. And from 1970 to current times, we lost approximately 30,000 petrol fill in stations. Out of those 7,398 filling stations with uh, shops, um, majority of them are located in urban areas, that's over approximately 40%. And then the second place takes shops in the residential areas, 28%. Altogether, between those two areas, our shops are located on 68% uh, locations. Um, many forecourts offer different types of shops. Uh, we've got a marginal uh, number of two percentage without pretty much any food and shops offering. And majority of the uh, forecourt shops offers uh, standard shops uh, with um, mainly sales of uh, minerals, uh, small selections of sandwiches and food on the go. Uh, we also seen a recently increase um, in the shops offering with uh, full convenience. Um, those um, are currently on 30% and constantly growing. Um, full convenience shops, they usually have uh, branded facias. Um, as we've seen across the UK, there might be um, London shops or, or recently uh, more open in Morrison's Daily, and uh, they are constantly growing. Those shops will have um, car park spaces as well for visiting customers. As you can see on this picture, current day forecourts offer a wide variety of services. Some are more popular than the other. However, they depend on customers they cater for. We've previously seen that the majority of forecourts are located in urban and residential areas. Therefore, the highest percentage services on offer will reflect the customer needs. On a separate note, food services becoming more popular and forecourt retailers are constantly coming up with new ideas and bespoke concepts to attract motorists. Customer operated coffee machine is now available nearly in seven out of 10 forecourts in the UK. Hot food has also gained its prominence. Nowadays, retailers are trying to concentrate on the still quite niche services, such as an in-store bakery or serve over coffee to attract new shoppers and build the USP. Forecourt product and offered services are continuously evolving. This is driven by customers changing habits and demand for convenience. Contribution of fuel retailing will continue to decline while non-fuel retail offerings will gain prominence. On the picture, you can see how the forecourt has changed up till now and how it will change in the future. So forecourt in the past, Mainly 90% of transactions were coming from fuel sales and only 10% from adjacent services. However, those adjacent services were still evolving around car services. In forecourts today, we can see the fuel transactions are bringing approximately 50% of the revenue and 35% is coming from retail food and beverages. And that's also sea stores um, and uh, fast food offers and 15% adjacent services. Um, that is still services, those services are still evolving around cars, um, such as car washes, um, air and tire and vacuums. However, in, in recent light of uh, pandemic, we have seen uh, increase of home delivery and uh, good services. And where is the future of a forecourt heading? Um, it has been seen that fuel transaction from 90% in the past will decline to 20% and we will see quite a vast improvement in revenue from retail food and beverages um, and that will be more advanced and more popular our sea stores, uh, new offers um, such as high-end restaurant, new food concepts, um, uh, luxury cafes. Uh, also adjacent services will grow and increase to approximately 30% and we will see a new 
trend emerging uh, such as mobility uh, where predicted number of transactions and revenue is, is growing to nearly 10%. In the next slide, I will discuss how retail and beverages adjacent services will form and evolve in the future to get to desired level. Let's start with some figures first. Uh, currently, the average basket size in the forecourt is 2.37 items, and the average transaction value is £6.64. That is, that is excluding, uh, obviously, fuel transactions. So we're purely concentrating here on um, uh, C-store sales and, and all sales coming from retail side of the forecourt. Uh, based on the UK market forecourt report 2020, only 19% of forecourt shoppers specify fuel as the main reason for visiting forecourt. Therefore, forecourt retailers are more often driven to develop C stores offering. The margin on C retailing are significantly higher than fuel. Due to the location advantage and the long opening hours of the forecourts, stores are becoming more one-stop convenience shops. They are also emerging as a great alternative to high traffic supermarkets. Um, three, three fundamental pillars of improved retail experience will evolve around in-store design, revamped product range and private labels. In terms of the in-store design, we are seeing even today um, the new forecourts and new service station look quite modern. Um, they have uh, open space, improved and increased retail space. Uh, in terms of the revamped products, um, retailers are concentrating on improved menus, uh, new concepts um, such as live food preparation uh, and altering product range uh, to cater for constantly cha changing habits of customers. In terms of private labels, uh, retailers trying to be different and try to create and drive brand loyalty. Adjacent services being seen as the future of the forecourt. Currently, retailers are focusing on new and innovating services to be able to cater to multiple customer needs. Those services will drive footfall via personalized offering. They will insight on right product service mix to customer and will harvest attractive profit pools with continuous evolution of service proposition. New concepts will require forecourt retailers to review their ideas to ensure the offers stay fresh and interesting over the time. Global mobility megatrends are transforming the industry, resulting in the emergence of new business models. Electrification will lead to partnerships between forecourt retailers, car makers and energy providers to expand EV charging beyond forecourts, while the forecourt of the future will have to be designed keeping in mind EV. The three main disruptive forces will fundamentally transform how people and things move in the future. And you can see on the slide, these three forces are electric vehicles, connected and autonomous vehicles and mobility as a service. And also on this slide, I added a picture of a, um, I would say fuel dispenser of tomorrow, where we can see um, a vast majority and, and big range of different fuels. And when I've mentioned in the beginning that the first uh, petrol filling station in the UK just uh, was a single operated machine, that will definitely change and that will definitely look uh, different in the future. Constantly changing shoppers mission of visiting Falkots is prompting continuous changes to the Falkot structure. Fuel sales are declining and will continue to do so in the future. Therefore, non-fuel retail offerings will be in demand and they will become even more prominent. Falkots are now not only seen as the petrol stations, but more as the convenience stores and the local hubs. Additionally, the future of Falkots is linked to the future ways of transport. Types of vehicles, shared mobility and alternative fuels will have an impact on the number and the purpose of the future forecourts. Forecourt retailers need to reimagine themselves in the face of the current disruption. Only the one who will make changes will survive. Thinking about innovation and constantly changing future vision, it is very important that forecourt retailers who do not future-proof themselves will perish and unfortunately 
share the vision and mission of the 30,000 Falcons disappeared between 1970 and 2012. On my next slide, um, I will show a picture, a vision of, um, of a future service station, uh, which is more like a community hub. Um, and that's, in my opinion, some, some vision and, and um, design uh, where the future of Falkots head into. Um, so on this picture, we can see a quite big building, um, very bright, very modern, with uh, big advertising screens on the front uh, to attract uh, customers driving past uh, to be able to pull over to services. That is kind of the unique point of sale um, and will attract uh, customers to visit in our future forecourt. Um, in terms of um, energy efficiency, um, I think uh, the future will grow into um, uh, solar panels. And we all know that there is quite a lot of electricity currently used on a uh, forecourts, and therefore uh, the solar roofs uh, will um, hopefully support and will be more environmentally friendly. Uh, in terms of design, um, I think the future forecourt needs to look appealing to customers in different age groups. Um, therefore, if we're visiting a forecourt, we don't want to feel enclosed in the building, in the glass walls. We want to be somewhere where we've got a feeling being inside and outside. Therefore, I believe um, green areas will be very popular and will be desired, where people can also spend time with, with the friends and the family and, and treat those area more as a um, cultural um, spaces. You can see also on the, on the side of the picture, uh, car park spaces. Uh, obviously space on the forecourt is very important and, and it's very pricey these days. Uh, therefore, I think the future in terms of a car park on the petrol forecourt uh, will be um, in type of a multi-story car parks. Um, Let's not forget about uh, mobility and, and, and the future trends. Um, so very, very small and very minimal, I would say, um, electric vehicles and, and different types of refuel, such as maybe hydrogen, um, that will still be available on the forecourt, although only 19% of customers uh, go to um, forecourt to actually purchase fuel, we still need to kind of remember of, of the basics and of the history uh, of, a, of a petrol forecourt. In terms of inside, the space inside, in my opinion, will be very modern, will be very bright, uh, with obviously retail offerings, various retail offerings. Um, we will have um, merge of technology on the petrol stations, um, where people can actually browse through the internet, um, something like internet shopping, but inside uh, the actual building. On the upstairs, you can see escalators going up uh, and very various uh, dining areas, various entertainment areas. Um, we also will have uh, pickup points. Let's not forget, we, we will probably visit um, fuel forecourt and petrol forecourt uh, to spend some time with, with obviously friends, do shopping, and we don't want to carry all these bags with us. Therefore, uh, future of orders might be that we will be able to order the products uh, and wait while the products are being prepared for us. We wouldn't need to carry it. We wouldn't need to worry about numbers of bags and, and different boxes uh, with us. We will also have some sort of a support uh, because I would, I would say still uh, people and human interaction will be very important, although um, we see technology being very advanced in the future. Um, let's visit upstairs. Obviously, I've mentioned during my presentation various food offerings, new concepts. Um, so I believe that will still be uh, growing and evolving and, and different cafes and food facilities will be available, um, such as virtual reality pods, um, because more likely um, future forecourt will become the area where, where professionals will choose to work from. Therefore, any conferences like today could be taken in the VR pods. It would be a space also uh, for, for kids and, and teenagers to, to grow and educate themselves. And uh, obviously uh, that would incorporate uh, constantly evolving technology as well. 
in terms of um, future of logistics and future of mobility, um, I believe drone delivery hubs will also evolve and um, while now we order in food through uh, various different apps, we will be able to obviously order that. And instead of having that delivery driver and extended waiting time, um, drones will more likely deliver the food to our doors. And that will also improve logistics and convenience of the whole service. So that was my vision of uh, a future service station. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Alexandra, that was really enlightening. And now we're going to hand over to Tom, who's going to show us around his sites. Thank you, Tom. Hi, my name's Tom Dant, and I'm the Managing Director of Jill Marsh Forecourts Limited. We started in 1971 with a single site in Billsby near Link, uh, in Lincolnshire. We purchased a second site in 1999, Partney near Spilsby, Lincolnshire. And in 2005, we did a new build site um, near Alford in Lincolnshire. All of our sites are around Skegness, so they're quite seasonal. We get a lot of holiday traffic and uh, everyone come into Butlins and the, uh, the sunny Lincolnshire coast. Um, we redeveloped our Billsby site in 2017, which was other than the walls and the ceiling we'd pretty much nearly knocked the shop down, um, relined all the tanks and just really went all out. It was a case of the store was doing 18,000 litres a week and taking 7,000 pound a week in the shop. Uh, and it was, do we invest in it or, or do we close it? We chose the invest option. Um, unfortunately, we did it just before the pandemic so that it, it really did pay off for us um, as we're seeing. Um, with the store is now 1500 square foot and we installed a car park so that customers could access us a lot better because we were finding that that people could come but they couldn't stop very long because we, the access was poor so that really really helped increase basket spend um, the pandemic really really changed that basket spend um, but we are seeing it come back down to sort of normal levels to sort of eight nine pounds which is far better because it was six pounds pre-pandemic. Um, we increased the chilled range in that store by 100%, I think it was. Um, and initially we saw a lot of waste, but, but you know, we, we've got it to a, a nice manageable level now. And that really, really helps us. Um, when we first reopened the store, the, the fuel sales increased by 300%. Um, and are still at that sort of level now and the shop sales subsequently had a 50% increase and now they've sort of leveled off at around 65% of, of previous levels which is uh, very very good. Um, our partner site which we purchased in 99 we refurbished that in 2018. Um, we, we looked at the market and we looked at trends and things what, what was happening and we we knew that the store could do a bit more um, and it was looking quite tired so we did a full shop refit um, and we were one of the first sites to put country choices stacked franchise in there which was uh, a bit scary at first because uh, when you're doing things new um, and the money that's involved it, it's a bit of a risk but long term it seems to be paying off um, they're opening more and they we're getting more brand awareness now which is is definitely what we want. We, we tailored the store towards um, what the way customers were shopping the store. It was a highly transient store, still is. So we, we limited the grocery range to a very small section and focused on food for now. So we've got two Costa machines, we've got for real in there, we've got uh, ice squeeze, orange juice, um, tango ice blast, all the, all the, the basics. And, and altogether, the store works really really well um, in the past probably 10 years the turnover has increased by about 150 percent in the shop so it, it's, it's really really good and really going in the right direction um, our Ulsby Cross site that we built in 2005 um, when we first built it it was a bit of a it was it was quite quiet and it, it, was it the right decision looking now um, 
yes, <laughs> it's, it's, it's definitely, it was the right decision to do. Um, it is 600 square foot, which is our smallest store, but it's also our busiest store. Um, some weeks we're taking 30, 31,000 pound a week out of 600 square foot, which is very, very hard work. Um, it's mainly food to go, that site. Again, it's transient. So the grocery section comprises of about a meter because people don't go in there to do their week shop. They go in there for a sandwich, a packet of crisps, etc., cetera, um, or, or a hot bath. So food to go in that store accounts for between seven and a half and eight thousand pounds a week's worth of sales. And obviously subsequently that brings really, really good margin, um, which, which really helps the store be uh, extremely profitable. Um, I like to keep on top of current trends in our stores. Um, so all stores now have Costa in them. Um, they've all got Tango Ice Blast. Um, majority of them have got Row Over Hot Dogs um, and just anything else that basically we, you know, is on trend. Um, we, we just try to uh, cater for everything the customer's looking for. And, you know, we put FWIP in the site a couple of months ago and uh, customers were purposely coming to the store because it was something different, nothing else in the area. And I really encourage people to look at different new things that, you know, and you've got to get in there at the right time. We put Costa in at the right time. We had little coffee machines that we did ourselves that were doing 40 cups a day. We put Costa in, it doubled overnight. And now the site that was doing 40 cups a day is doing 180 cups a day. So, you know, you've got to, get on top of these trends and we've got established with that now over the past six years. So it's really, really done as well. Um, Dunkin' Donuts was another one. We've, uh, through our partnership with Blake Moores, we've done really, really well with Dunkin' Donuts over the summer. Um, and we, we keep crying out for getting more range from them, but it's, it's still very early days and um, initial signs are, are really, really positive. The pandemic for us was quite a challenge. Um, because two out of the three stores are transient. So therefore the fuel sales dropped by 75% overnight in all stores. Shop sales in the transient stores dropped by 50, 60%. Uh, you know, we're all of a sudden we'd gone from being really busy to you could almost see a tumbleweed going past the sites because they are literally in the middle of nowhere. Um, but we didn't, uh, we didn't hold our head in our hands for too long um, due to our, our Billsby site, which was which we'd redeveloped into a into a village shop and supermarket, so that the sales went were 100 percent up the other way. So we used the downtime in the um, transient stores to set up a home delivery service, um, as many retailers did um, and are still doing. Um, we used the the stores that are required to take the phone calls and collate the orders, and the busier store that had got the range and, and the good stock to to deliver the stuff um, and we're still we're still doing reasonably well in deliveries now even though we're out of lockdown it was definitely um, a good decision and again goes back to getting in there early other sites were very, uh, around us were quite slow at doing it in the supermarkets you couldn't get a slot for months and still now they're still quite poor around here in slots it's still a week so um, that's that's really helped us through our, again through our partnership with Blakemore's we took on Snappy Shopper quite early um, last year, and we're still doing extremely well with that. Um, it's more of a challenge now that we have to get it to customers within an hour, whereas we had a bit of a leeway in the pandemic. But you know, it's uh, it's definitely the way people are going to shop in the future now is they want it now, they want it delivered to them rather than going into a store. So you've got to adapt and and, and evolve really. Um, going on to that when we were looking at the sales mix in the height of the pandemic in the um in billsby it was we'd gone from selling crisps and sweets to selling no single crisps and no single sweets to multi-packs meat and fruit and veg went from 100 quid a week to 800 quid a week and all of a sudden you've got this massive fresh business that that was not there before so we, it's been a really real steep learning curve to manage waste on that and do what's best for us and for the customer. Um, Blakemore's launched their County Bridge Meats range, which we trialed, which has been immensely popular. 
um, having good quality meats uh, at good good prices, and, and that's really helped us with our fresh credentials in the area. We we do get people. We have some small trolleys, and we do get people doing trolley trolley shops, um, and 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 having a hundred pound home shopping orders. So, uh, but but again, we're we're not resting on our laurels. We're we're still reviewing the store. We're moving categories around again this week, looking and going: is this right? What's working? What's not working? Um, I guess as an independent, we're very, we have very, we can be very nimble. So that's what we've done. We've looked. Okay, yeah, this has worked. It's worked for six months. Now it's not working. Take it out. Swap it for something else, um, uh, and move on. So so yeah. Um, Going on to um, food to go, uh, not food to go, sorry, um, electric charging and things like that. We're, we were in talks with the electric charging supplier a few years ago, but it's still very up in arms. Uh, you, nobody really knows where it's going. So we have got a few points being installed uh, at no cost to us to see how they go, um, one on each side, just as a dipping our toes in the water, but um, the jury's definitely not out on that. So uh, we'll just have to kind of see how that goes. But um, thank you very much for listening to my presentation. Um, and I look forward to uh, answering any questions on the panel. Thank you very much, Tom. That was really interesting. Some great photos there. And now using the magic of technology, more technology, Damien from Northern Ireland is going to show Patrick, who's in Hull, around his store. So over to you guys. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm Patrick. Uh, thanks ever so much for handing over Sarah. I'm joined today by uh, Damien from Henderson's. Uh, Damien, just introduce yourself a little bit. Tell us who you are. Hi, Patrick. Thank you. Uh, I'm Damien Nevin. I work for the Henderson Group. I'm the Retail Development Manager for our company-owned stores for our proposition and formats. And, and today we're going to um, discuss one of our new stores that opened this year, Eurospar Doak. Great. Well, I've had a sneaky little peek already and it looks superb. So, um, thank you. technology permitting, I'm going to have a little wander around and I'll have a, a chat. So, um, I'll just do a, a quick 360 of the entrance coming in. See, it's a forecourt. You have a Texaco branded outside? Yeah, we're a Texaco branded forecourt. It's a new build store that opened in June of this year. Um, we, we've got three three pump islands on, on, on the site. Uh, we offer 32 car parking spaces and there's a second retail unit on site as well. Um, the store is located in a, in a rural village and we would class this as a community supermarket. So it's offering everything for that community, a one-stop shop for them. A post office in there and some fantastic local products as well, which we can talk through. Yeah, and was it is this an entirely new to industry site or was it a redevelopment? Uh, there was an existing retail unit on the site, much smaller, and before that, a car garage. So we, we, we operated the site for around a year uh, and then obtained planning permission and did a knockdown and rebuild and uh, built a 5,200 square foot retail space Eurospar. So it's a slightly larger format mid tier supermarket. Um, and it offers something great for the local community. There, there's a fantastic comprehensive range in here. We've got just over 100 ambient beds and over 30 fresh beds offering something for the customer for that fresh three-day top-up shop um, and offering everything they need for tonight's tea. Okay, well, let's give people an opportunity to have a little browse around. Uh, I know that if you turn to the left here, we'll end up walking towards the, the till areas. Is that correct? Yeah, the checkouts are located at the opposite end of the yeah. store. So um, the, the main mission for this store is, is tonight's tea and something for that for later purchase. But we do offer something for now. So you can see the sandwiches and pre-packed chilled drinks along there. Value is very important to our business. So there's a strong value message between fresh and ambient as you walk in. And you can see that on the gondola ends as well. Um, yeah, it's really impactful that with promotion. It's plenty of space, which I guess I always find is important. Sometimes you, you tend to sometimes fill um, shops up with lots of shelving and actually you need plenty of aisle space and stacking space as well. Yeah, that's really important to us to maintain good customer flow around the store, not just during COVID, but if we're trying to encourage customers to fill a basket or a trolley, it's really, really important they can do that with the ease and especially when the store is very busy. Um, it, it really is quite spacious and feels bright and open and it is easy to shop um, for consumers, which is really, really important. 
One thing that struck me also is the, the sort of point of sale and the, the, the floor stickers, the super deals. Um, I guess it's you know, very good from a customer comms perspective. Yeah, so this is this is a new look and feel for Eurospar. So we actually relaunched the brand this year, and we went with a with a slightly different look and feel that emphasizes those key departments and creates a very innovative and exciting shop that that is conducive to allowing customers to shop and browse with ease. Um, the the columns are brighter, more colorful, um, and it does provide a real point of difference. You can see there, for example. You know, we're really shouting about strong value within Ambient. Um, we offer a Tesco price match across th uh, over a thousand products, um, which does give customers the, the, the confidence that we are offering value locally. Um, and then our super deals is our three weekly promotional cycle, which offers market leading, leading offers across a range of products. Um, so our columns are simple. We strip them back, but it allows those main messages really to punch through across fresh and Ambient. So I said, I had a sneaky peek earlier on, and I, I see you had. Um, six sort of customer set points, three self-scan tills there, is it? And three further ones around here? Yeah, so we offer customers a bit of choice. So consumers can choose to be served at a main bank checkout, and those are easy to use, offering good space for trolleys to pack and unpack. We also offer then three standalone self-scan checkouts. Those take up the same amount of space, allowing customers and um, space to unpack their trolley and repack it really, really easily. Um, we, we don't really force customers to do it. They have a choice. If they're, if they're wanting a convenient quick stop, they can use the self-scan checkouts. And every week, around 46% of our transactions are going through the self-scan checkouts, which is pretty amazing in a four-court site with quite a high basket spend. Interestingly, we offer the glory cash management at all till points in this store. Uh, and that means the, the checkout operator uh, doesn't have to handle any money at all. Customers insert the coins and notes that get uh, put into a little cassette that counts it and tallies that up and then it's brought to the back office and is counted automatically. So it offers a real efficiency for our store team. It allows them to focus on other things on the shop floor, helping consumers and, and efficiently packing things out whilst not having to do those more mundane tasks. How have they been received by your sort of team members? Do they see them as being positive or do they see them as sort of um, taking roles away from them or? No, it's a real positive because it allows us to invest in a better hourly rate and allows them to interact with customers on the shop floor. And those are the real positives. That's why we're doing it. It allows us to, to get people customer facing and helping you find those products or helping, you know, maintain fantastic standards across our fresh produce section or our dairy base. So um, everybody's really bought into that and, and it definitely does work. Yeah. Again, I, I just the, the point of sale was keep the queue concept and the floor stickers and around the, around the store. Really yeah, good. just reinforcing those convenient pieces. Whilst we're a supermarket, we are offering a convenient supermarket to the consumer. And, and, and for those people who are time pressed, it has to be a quick and easy transaction. So just as a point on the spacious aisles, it's equally as important to get people in and out as quick as possible. Um, and those are some of the things that we really focused on during COVID as well, maintaining quick, fast service and allowing people to get in and out of the store as quick as possible. Yeah. I guess what you've said earlier on about the store being quite focused as being a, a sort of rural community location. So I guess thus the, the post office you have there. Yeah, a really, really important part of the business. Um, you know, the closest town might be 10, 15 miles away, offering that mean banking opportunity or business opportunity, or just for the local post office transactions. So we see the post office as a real heart of our stores in the community, offering people all those services they would expect. And where possible, we try and create that little bit more space to allow people to have time to interact with the post office staff member and feel, you know, comfortable and secure if they are doing banking. And then obviously customer toilets, which... Um, yeah, we, we, we do try and offer at least two customer toilets on four court sites where space is available. Uh, it, it's something that we, we, we do as standard now in all our stores. Yeah. So then uh, I guess uh, down this aisle, obviously we've got frozen to our left for a pretty comprehensive um, proposition. Yeah. yeah, there's a strong range of frozen there. It's a growing market and it does offer people, you know, a great meal deal solution. You know, there's some cracking desserts in there as well. Um, and it, it, it's suitably sized to suit that supermarket shopper. Yeah. How are we focused on um, sort of energy in terms of obviously being a new build property? Um, obviously, uh, thinking about some of the stores I've seen locally to me where they've got sort of maybe doors on fridges and such like, or just, just has that been a focus area for you on energy and sustainability? 
So um, in terms of energy and sustainability, all our lighting is LED track lighting, and we've maintained good standards across that. We haven't chosen to put the word on the refrigeration, but we have added in the aerofoil technology to allow that distribution of cold air to be maintained yeah. within the cabinets. Um, and it's, it's, it's on the top shelves just to allow that cold air to stay within the cabinets, which is twofold. It is more environmentally friendly, but also for the store teams in store, it keeps the cold air within the fridge as well. Um, and we find that works just as well as the doors. And there's there's a lot of daylight coming into that shop as well, which means you know we're not needing the the, the lighting just as much. Um, and it, it's all energy efficient. We'll turn off when the store is closed, etc. Uh, most of our site lighting is on on photovoltaic, so it'll turn on just when required uh, when it's dark. Yeah. So. Um... I, I quite like the the branding, the, the sort of um, green sort of neon and the the um, pale aqua, I guess it would be. But uh, is that is that unique to to this store, or is that spa branding? Uh, the, those are our Eurospar department colours for the likes of produce in in the fresh area, and then our main inspiration. So I guess when the consumer walks in, the whole concept of this space, it's probably about forty five to fifty percent of the floor space of the store. It, it's to show all of our fresh, as much of our fresh foods as possible on entry. So we specifically tiered the merchandising here to maintain good sight lines across the back of the shop and to allow consumers to see, you know, a fantastic local butchery just to the left of your screen there. So we partnered with a local butcher, Jenkins. Um, they're located in a local town. So this is their second store and they operate this space. Uh, fantastic local provenance with, with great quality products in terms of meat and poultry. And they rear all the animals on their own farm. So for consumers, they recognize the brand. It creates a real strong foodie credential within the store, and it is it is a staple of that tonight's tea purchase and the next three day fresh top up shop. So it's great yeah. when you walk in through the door, you can see that you can resonate towards it, and it starts up. Um, the, the sort of deli area. Yeah, so we've we've got a smaller footprint for food to go here because the main mission for this store is for tonight's tea, but we still do offer with it being a four court site. You know, something for everybody across lunch and breakfast, snacking range, fantastic coffee through our barista bar, um, which is Northern Ireland's leading coffee brand, and also something sweet from the Spa Bakery as well. So there's something for everybody in here, let it be a served or self-served product. Yeah. When, when did you open the Thaldarian? Uh The store opened in June of this year. Okay. And that has um, COVID times changed the, the plan of the store? Is, is that or was it sort of originally always like this? Uh, we originally had planned a large format store here, probably give us more confidence um, post COVID that consumers are, you know, shopping more within a neighborhood vicinity. And um, we, we work really, really hard within our stores to emphasize the community aspect and giving back to our neighbors. You know, we're not a we're not a multiple. We are we are serving at the heart of every community, and I think that has really worked very well for us. Um, it offers consumers something convenient, meaning they don't have to go to the large out of town, Tesco, multiple Sainsbury's, Alice to the likes. This offers them a compelling reason to stay local. It's convenient and it's safe. Um, so th those have all factored into how we've let out the store, maintaining those spacious aisles and, and not cramming in another aisle to give a decent aisle width to allow people to shop with ease. Yeah. Just going back to one of your early points about how many parking spaces you have. And um, I guess you, you must get a lot of pedestrian trade as well, do you? If you're yeah, especially in this setting with it being a village setting, we get a lot of walk on trade and um, we have the, the confines of the site. So 32 is the maximum we can get in and we find that that, that will have its peaks at certain times of the day. Um, but we are located close by schools and everything as well. So there is that walk on trade within the local village. So the locals see it as a great, a fantastic asset to the village. You know what, maybe they don't have to leave and go to go to the out of town um, shops. And um, so all in all, it's, it's worked very, very well. Mm. Uh, honestly, Jamie, it looks wonderful, and I guess um, when you spend a lot of money, as, as you have done clearly, to develop this, I guess, you know, being mindful of being fit for the future and uh, not not entirely relying on fuel. The fuel is there, I guess, at the moment and will continue to be for the foreseeable, but uh, you've got a, a full shop there that's going to attract you, the local community to come and buy from you. So it looks, looks really very good. Oh, thank you. We're really proud of it, so we are, yeah. Okay. Great. Well, I shall uh, hand back to the guys at the Association of Convenience Stores. Thank you, Damien. Thank you, Patrick. Bye. Thank you very much, Damien and Patrick and um, Alexandra and Tom for those really great presentations and such a wide variety of forecourts that we have in the sector.
Um, so I'm going to ask the guys to join me back on the panel so we can I can ask them some questions. And please remember to ask them on the um, on the question panel at the side and I will get those and be able to ask them myself. So so please send your questions to us. Um, so first of all, um, when we look at this, the session this morning, um, we're obviously moving into more electric vehicles and alternative fuels. So I guess the main question I'm going to ask is, well, what is it, shopping versus electric charging? How do you determine which one you're going to have on site? So I'm going to come to Patrick first. How do you decide how do you decide how many of your stores have got either? Because I know you you run a number of very successful um stores in sites in Hull. Morning, everybody. Um yeah, I guess it's a it's a difficult one, and I guess it's it's ever changing as well. It's um we put an EV charger, I dare say just a seven kilowatt charger unit um, on, sorry, I said this was going to happen, my cat came to attack me, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, we put a seven charger on a site developed six years ago, and that was just a, a an attempt to see what, where the market would go. And um, so we didn't have the relationships with the, the company. The market was very immature at that point in time. So, um, but even doing it then, we realized that um, just taking up one parking space and two parking space, it, it was eating away from sort of the convenience of being able to get into the shop. Um, so here we are for my business sort of six years on. Um, and actually we don't have any significant EV facility at the moment, certainly not for the want of looking and exploring. Um, and I guess, the whole thing about EV is that it, it's not quite here. Clearly, clearly there is a you know uh, uh, a growing proportion of EV vehicles, um, but for us at the moment, it's, it's still a very difficult question as to allocating space. Um, I think maybe my last point, it, my last point on it, Sarah, maybe is just having a, a total refresh of look at everything on the forecourt, everything from the space allocated to, to jet washes and airlines uh, and any other facilities you might have and everything you know sweat space spacing okay thanks and Damien you mentioned you had 32 parking spaces on your new site are any of those charging no not on this particular site we don't have any EV charging um like Patrick we don't have any significant offer at this moment in time it is something we are looking at very closely uh it is becoming a lot more um publicized and a lot more mainstream but it's not quite there yet um, we will launch EV in two sites this year, and for us, it'll be sites with a higher existing fuel leadage as a, as a key metric to say, well, there's a potential of high footfall, very transient site, and that's where EV would probably work. The one thing that we're seeing is it, it does take a lot of infrastructure to get it up and running, mm. and the technology is, is updating very, very quickly, so you could be very quickly out of date with something that's still very new. So for us, um, you know, a pre we're, 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 we have lots of forecourts, but equally convenience and food shopping is is still a major drive to our stores with the forecourt in some cases becoming a secondary piece. It will become more mainstream, but it's definitely not the main driver as a mission to our stores at this moment in time. Okay, and Tom, you, you, you're you not convinced, I know, from, from the film. However, I did have a question that came through that asked about how um, non-forecourts would, uh, would take um, charging. So if you became convinced, would you put them into your um, neighbourhood stores or would you leave them, you know, how, how do you think if you do become, would you, would you put some in neighbourhood stores? Uh, I think, yes, I would. Um, purely because you've, you've almost turned a convenience store into a into a bit of a forecourt without any of the um, hassle of petroleum officers and, and all that kind of stuff. But I think for our stores, we don't have the space to. Their majority are high street stores, so they don't have parking or the parking is local authority that have put their own charging infrastructure in. So um, I, I think, again, it, it all comes down to a, the space of your car park as well, because I think if you if you dedicated or lost four bays to EV charging and you don't have any EV customers in your area, all you're doing is limiting the amount of customers that you could serve in your stores. So yes. I think it's not an overnight decision. It's quite something that's got to be very carefully considered, I think. Yeah, absolutely. 
So, Alexandra, looking at your plan for the future, um, you're predicting that consumers will spend more time using services rather than retail. And some interesting suggestions about kind of co-working spaces, um, children's play areas. But how are they going to um, use the site? How What will they lose? to? Because obviously they've only got a small uh, area or some. You know, how, how are they going to work the sizing of their site for that? Will they have to cut down retail or how do you envisage that happening? This is a very good question, Sarah. Um, as you could see on my presentation, majority of the focus with shops are located in um, urban and residential areas. So space obviously is a key. Um, it would be probably easier to rebuild and redesign uh, forecourt stations and uh, facilities when you're dealing with a new build. Um, however, the current uh, forecourt retailers will have to adapt and will have to redesign themselves. So um, obviously reviewing the current space and the current offerings, uh, we were talking about obviously EV charging. I, I do believe that in, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 years, we probably would not see a forecourt as what we see now. There won't be any petrol dispensers. There won't be any canopy. That space would probably be made redundant. Therefore, all the retailers will gain the additional space. Um, EV charging facilities are quite small so um, that the charger itself does not really take a lot of space so I believe um, certain uh, forecourts could probably redevelop themselves into the space where the current dispensers are and um, that will give quite a lot of potential to to rebuild or, or add additional facilities such as drive-throughs etc so I think that's where that's where retailers and forecourt retailers are going and, and that's the space um, they probably will need to consider for the future redevelopments. Okay thank you I and also I'm interested in in the the drone delivery um, that you also put on there um, so um, do you think Damien um, I'll come to you first do you think that um, maybe drone is the next level of delivery can you see your sites having a drone um, I don't know what is it, air, um, runway or whatever you use, whatever they're called to take off from at your new site? Um, I, th I think that's quite a step into the future, but I do think consumers want to think quicker than, than calling into the shop. So on demand delivery will become a major part of convenience, but it already is. There's lots of players already doing that. Um, so I think that will become more and more you know, important to consumers as people have reevaluated what time they have. Uh, you know, convenience customers are time precious. Some will not want to call physically to the store. We still will have customers who do want to call to our stores. And we, we, we try and provide um, lots of services within our stores to create that community hub to give people more reasons to call to the store, not just for fuel, you know, but for, you know, potentially a butchery, a post office, um, a larger range of food to go on a transient site. So we're trying to maximize those different things whilst looking at on-demand delivery and, and that could be through a third party um, or in some of our stores we're providing that delivery piece as well so I think drone deliveries will probably happen in the future but I think it's something that you'll see you know big players taking on first and then convenience will move into it when it becomes much more mainstream I think it will be extremely risky to, to move into that field before we we learn from other experts. And Tom how about you do you do delivery at the moment? Uh, we do when we operate it ourselves at the moment. Um, I think it all depends on, and again, it's all technology based. Uh, we're very rural, so uh, drones probably wouldn't have the capacity to do what we need it to do. So we would probably be more the traditional delivery van type thing. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you look at this 18 months ago, we'd never be thinking that we'd be, we'd have a delivery driver, we'd have a van going around seven days a week delivering stuff. To villages it's just a complete shift so who knows what's what the future holds with it really um patrick when you went around um damien's store was there anything that you you took away from it that i mean that you thought you might bring home i mean i know that a lot of people they go on study tours with us and they were like there's always one thing that i bring home can you can you share what that might have been with with damien's store be fair, I'd quite like to lift it up and just transport it across to, to Hull straight away, just as it is. Um, but um, I, I think it, it, it's 
it struck me as fitting the bill for um, for for future proofing as well. I, I think it was nice and spacious, you know, flexible because in essence trends change and also things that you put into the site. Some things work really well, some things don't. Um, so you, you know you need to be able to adapt the site in the future and. Um, I know on, on Tom's uh, video earlier, sort of saying about his, his small site with 600 square foot, it obviously gives you limitations when you've got such a small store. Good that it's very profitable. Um, but um, when Damien's store was nice and big and, and airy, um, then I guess I imagine that if you go back to that store in five years' time, it, it won't quite look the same. There'll be, there'll be changes in there of certain lines and trends that have evolved. So I think that flexibility was really good. Um, I think... Um, Technology, I think, is going to be a big part, um, and uh, some of the sort of scan tills, which I think we might come on a bit later on, um, productivity, efficiencies, those sort of things. So those are what I was looking at really with, with Damien. Um, and you mentioned about self scan. So, Damien, do this to self scan tills do petrol as well? Do your fuel? Or are they yeah. purely? They do the whole thing. They do the whole thing, yeah. Just to offer customers that convenience piece. So for any few other ages, respective pieces, a staff member will have to, you know, approve that purchase. Yeah. Um, so as a staff member out on the floor helping customers through the sales scan. And again, as Patrick said, it's offering what is twofold. It's offering customers convenience in terms of how they want to be served. And also it is offering efficiencies back to the store as well. And you said that 49%, uh, sorry, 46% go through sales scan. Is that a certain demographic or is that kind of across the board? Um, we find it's across the board. When, when we open a brand new store and we put the cell scan in from day one, it's an easier change from a consumer habit point of view. Um, and we find that because we've given space to the cell scan checkout, that you can easily unpack a trolley and repack it. It, it, it doesn't discriminate against the customer buying, you know, a couple of items first to the larger basket then. And in the particular store we've reviewed, it, it is a community supermarket, so we've got a higher than average basket spend. People are more inclined to fill a basket or a trolley. And the 40, 46% of transactions is a real game changer for us there, you know, in terms of dealing with the peak periods of trades. It is a community type store, so, you know, it's early mornings, late afternoons, busy weekends. So having a mixture of self scan and serve really, really does help the customers. And Tom, uh, is it something that you would consider having in, in both the fuel ones and the non fuel sites? Yeah, I mean, obviously, we're, our space is, is a premium, but we have got self checkout with fuel on at one of our sites, which, but the, the customers didn't really use it. Um, it was more older demographic. It was mm. people that were coming there because they wanted interaction with people. So they wanted somebody to serve them. So we got it as we were trialing it for our pod supplier and yeah hardly i think i'm the only one that uses it really so <laughs> I, I think it really does depend on your demographic if you've got a younger demographic then definitely if i go into a store um i always go to self-checkout over a man i don't know what it is just the way i am but um majority of our customers just just didn't want that so we've got pay at pump as well so if you have got people that want to just be in and out without even interacting in the store they can be on their way and that works very well. So I think, yeah, it's a demographic based. Mixture, yeah, absolutely. And um, Patrick, one of the things that I noticed in Damien's store, and in fact that is more prevalent in Northern Ireland, is the fact that um, concessions tend not to be branded or not kind of, it's not a Starbucks or a Costa. Um, and it works really well. Is that something that you can see coming in more in the UK market? I think hopefully so. Um... I listened to a, a, a very uh, eminent person in the industry, actually from, uh, from a Joe from Apple Green, actually a, a few weeks ago, <laughs> talking about uh, brands and, and um, some of Apple Green's experience of, of how in Ireland it was very much about local and community brands, and and all of a sudden when Apple Green came over to the UK ten years ago, I guess it would be, um, was that um, the the, U, the the UK population like. Um, um, national brands you know they, they have confidence in them so I guess the trick ultimately and I guess it's that every community is different um, I think trying to get the best, best of both worlds um, I think a, a national or global brand is very helpful and gives, gives customers um, you know, confidence but actually that's often about customers that don't know your store very well 
I guess those sort of community hubs where people know the store and have been in before and had that reliability um, of the, the uh, produce, of the food that they're getting, then I, I guess a local brand should win out really. Um, so, so yeah, I think that is a big opportunity for the industry to, to have more of that. And Tom, you've got the, the new stacked range uh, in your store. Is that is that working well for you? Do, do people realise, you know, not are quite happy with it not being a branded concession? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think it, it took a while to get to that point. But um, once people tried it and realised that the quality was there uh, and the price point was similar to the major brands, um, they're perfectly happy with it. I think it, customers do obviously uh, prefer our brand um, but we're trying to give them something alternative so that we can make it work for us and for them you know commercially because sometimes yes a brand brings a lot of people in but when you sit down and look at the numbers you're probably worse off sometimes um, unless you've got really really high football so and Alexandra apart from that what else do you see as um, the uh, evolving food to go so are there any trends that you think will be coming forward uh, I think people like bespoke services and obviously we've mentioned here about brands and I think it's 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 all to do with education as well and and uh, buying into the brand so um, Patrick's mentioned obviously about conversation with Joe uh, if we think about brands these days like Costa for example Costa started somewhere as well and at the time when they um, when they first came to the market they they weren't very well known they needed time and they needed uh, more stores to obviously develop the brand and the product so I think um, in terms of brands it's, it's always a little bit tricky and it always takes a lot of time and effort and marketing behind it as well in terms of current trends i think uh, what i've mentioned in my presentation it was quite interesting when i find found out um the numbers um seven out of ten petrol stations got um this coffee dispensers but i think what we're noticing now as well the um the coffee made on site from a cafe uh, that is gaining uh, more um popular uh, it's it's more attractive to customers because they they get service as well as a product they've got a time to interact with with a colleague who actually prepares the product for them so um so it's not only about the product but it's also about the interaction which comes with the product um so i think obviously coffees and i think obviously food to go so the stacked range i've seen it uh, on on various websites and in various different retailers as well um, I think we've recently had in some of our stores um, individually packed pizza slices as well. Um, so, so anything new, anything unique, uh, what's coming on the market, that's, that's always really good to go behind. Um, what you. is going to happen in the future? I think people are going a lot into healthy eating, um, the trends in, in vegans and vegetarians. So, so I think that is a big possibility and opportunity for the future retailers. Um, and we are seeing uh, more ranges on site as well well tailored to those customers um, and I think in next probably few years um, that healthy range and, and vegan and vegetarian will grow as well. Oh, thank you that's really interesting and I'm going to just going to come as a final uh, similar question actually final question to Patrick, Damien and Tom if there's if I'm looking to the future what what area are you are you looking at do you think will be the most difference in the future. So what you, what's your kind of, this is the bit that I think will change the most um, as we look to sort of five to 10 years ahead. Um, so Alexandra said kind of the vegan, um, uh, vegetarian. Um, Patrick, I'm gonna to come to you first, then Damien, then Tom. Crystal ball time, as they said on the earlier presentation. Um, well, I, you know, I think Alexandra sort of touched on the fact that, you know, if you, if you trace the history back, you can kind of learn from the fact that everything does change so the last decade the decade before that so um inevitably looking forward um what what we can't afford to do is just continue to do the same because um you know it, it, it commercially has been very good for for quite a lot of businesses in the forecourt sector uh, despite the, the challenges on, on fuel um and I, I i forecast it it will be good you know for the near future as well um it's just good. you can't bury your head in the sand you've, you've got to sort of look at the next step um, 
briefly, I would say that we you just got to be um, have lots of facilities. You've got to we've got to almost be all things to all people because that's I'm a 24 hour business, 365 days of the year. So what one customer wants on a Monday it might be the same customer on a Saturday, but they want something entirely different. Um, so it's about remaining relevant, sort of following what your customers want. So conscious of time. So <laughs> don't worry. Thank you, Patrick. Damien, what about you? Yes, pretty much the same as Patrick and Alexander, I guess, you know, our business, we're, we're, we're trying to be as much as we can to all different people. We operate sites across different communities, different um, locations throughout Northern Ireland. So, you know, something appeals in, in one place, it may not appeal to another customer. So you have to be on top of the trend. You have to capitalize on the trend as quick as you can to be in there. Um, also listening to our customers, reacting and changing as we need to. You know, we're a for later and a for now business. So it's, it's maximizing the USPs within both those main missions to your consumers and, and not being afraid to flex that space in order to capitalize on any trends. Um, I guess we always try to put the customer at the heart of what we're doing. And I think if we guide by that principle, then we probably shouldn't be too far off what we need to do. And Tom, I'm going to come to you. I, I, I'm guessing you're going to agree with the others, but I'm not going to um, let you speak as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly with our sites, we, we're in the process of looking to go, OK, what's next? How can we get more out of them? Um, you know, we, you've kind of got to go two routes. You've either got to go the full convenience route and make it a destination store for grocery, or you've got to make it almost like a motorway service area. So nearly any site that's going to survive has got to have a basic core facility of, you know, good toilets and brands and this, that and the other to be able to su survive. Obviously, you know, if, if the fuel goes to 20% in 10, 15 years times of what it is now, you've got to get that profit from somewhere to make the business viable. So, Brilliant. I mean, I you're outstanding. The fact that you have to think about so many things all the time and, you know, you've got all of these consumers who all want different things on different days and you're trying to keep ahead of the game is unbelievably amazing. And your stores, I know, Patrick, we didn't see them today, but run some amazing stores as well. So I want to thank you all for being part of it, part of um, looking after our consumers so well. So thanks very much for your time today. Um, it was really great. I'm going to hand over to Ed to, uh, to finalise the day. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah, and thank you to all of our speakers today. And, and it's uh, over to me to really sum up what we've heard from the Power Mobility and Convenience Conference today. In our first session, we talked uh, about the future of, of power and mobility and what that mean for fuel retailers. And we, we saw a lot of synergy between government, between car manufacturers and between retailers around the future trajectory of the EV market and the associated uh, infrastructure, how alternative fuels might help us there on the pathway, but they in themselves are not a solution, and that hydrogen may be a solution for some heavy goods vehicles, but will not form part of the mass uh, car market infrastructure. Um, uh, clearly, the rollout of, uh, of electric vehicle uh, infrastructure will focus around um, uh, fast charging, and that fuel retailers have a, have a clear role to play in delivering part of that. But there's still a lot to do, and it appears that consumer change in that market um, has got a long way to go yet. And that links in, I think, to what we heard in the store of choice uh, session, where there's very much a watching brief from retailers around the provision of electric vehicle charging. Um, it's not quite there in terms of uh, mass market appeal, and we heard lots of retailers don't have it yet, but they continue to watch. And actually, what most retailers are looking at <clears throat> is how they look at new trends that are coming up and sweat their existing space to offer all the different services that their customers want um, as they come up. So really strong insights from, from Tom, from Damien, Patrick and Alex, Alexandra around the future of fuel sites. So thank you very much to all of them for sharing their insights and taking the time to talk to us. Thank you for all of your questions. There's an opportunity to engage in the content of today's session again by going onto the ACS member portal to watch back all of the presentations and see all the questions. And I urge you to do that. If you need help accessing that portal, then please contact myself or Sarah or any member of the ACS team who will help you be able to access the portal to watch this back and also share it with members of your team that would also like to see what was said today. And then looking ahead to future ACS events, we've got some coming up. So dates for your diary, grab your pen. 18th of October, we have half the community conference coming up. 
And then 21st of October, we have the forecourt report launched and study tool will be visiting a, a GridServe EV charging uh, centre. So please sign up for that as well. So thank you very much for taking the time to join the ACS Power Mobility and Convenience Conference. We hope you found it useful and we hope to see you again at our upcoming events. Thank you very much.